Hello everybody, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&A. Remember these questions are from people who are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. If you want to find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you can go to biggameindicatingdogs.com and you can follow Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. You can also follow my own personal stuff at Paul John Michaels on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube as well. Let's get into the Q&A. So the first question here is from Devon. Uh, Devon, hi Paul, I've got a small question. I did my first skin scent today and my pup went really well. Crept up the last couple of metres and gave her good praise. I could see her winding it from a while away too, so that's good. Uh, so this is just doing the skin work that's in the deer dog training blueprint. We do a lot of that, setting the your pup or dog up on a wind scent and on skin skin drags as well um, using deer skin and we go into a lot of detail on that break it all down but it's basically just all about get teaching the pup how to hunt you know pups will a, a, any pup or dog will hunt on a fresh skin scent uh, easily you know it's not about teaching the dog how to hunt a scent like a dog will do that it's about tidying it all up um getting the dog used to following commands and staying close to you and keeping you part of the whole thing as well and just smoothing the whole thing out. A lot of it's about teaching you, the handler, to read the dog as well. At doing this work, it also does uh, help to just knock off those early rough edges that a pup or a dog can have when it's first learning how to track and how to move in on a wind scent, um, it's it's huge, it's huge. It just smooths everything out. So when you and the dog come to doing it the first time out in the field, you both know what you're doing, and it, it all goes a lot easier and smoother. So Devin's doing this. Everything's gone well. Uh, but after I... After I get to it and I pick the skin up though, um, the dog's got there, everything's gone well, he's given the dog the right amount of praise and all of that done, everything correctly. He's got there, he's picked the skin up and now the dog started jumping up at him trying to grab the skin. He's saying, what would you do here? He said, I, I kept giving command of disapproval but she kept doing it. She also picks it up and runs away and gets really possessive of it and won't bring it back unless I pull her in with the long line. Um, yeah, so this is a really good question because it's not it's there's some obvious concerns here straight away, right? Like you don't want the dog to get possessive of it. You don't want the dog jumping up at you and trying to bite something that's in your hand and all of that. That's not what we're after here, sort of respect and relationship and basic control wise. It's just not the sort of road that we want to go down. Um, but also you're trying to teach the dog to hunt the skin and that the skin's the good thing that we want. And and part of it is praising the dog when it gets there. And and then now the dog's getting all, and it's a good thing. The dog's stoked. It's clicking like, okay, this is something that we're going to do. Dogs are love being trained in a way that they can understand and then being shown a process, something cool that they can do. They love scent work and when it all comes together and the dog clicks like, oh, this is what we're doing, it's even more so later on in the field once we start hunting and the dog pulls it all together, all your training for that first year and you start shooting deer and praising the dog there and then you go back out and you look for them again, you find another one and you shoot it. The dog, you can just see dogs clicking and going, you know, holy shit, this is something that we can do. They just love it. They just love it. Um, and as a young dog is starting to get that, you obviously don't want to be too hard on it either when it's starting to get stoked and it's jumping up at you while you're holding the skin and it's getting all stoked on it. So my notes here, uh, you definitely don't want to be too hard on it. Uh, it's good that she's so keen on it. You also want to try and put those boundaries in place. Um, I've got here her jumping up 
while you have it isn't too bad, uh, her running off with it isn't good. You're talking about how sometimes she'll pick it up and run off and she won't come back to you unless you lo- use the long line to pull her back in. That, that sort of thing isn't good, that sort of possessive grabbing it, running away and sort of doing, going into that sort of catch me if you can type of game. No good at all. Um, and I've, another note here I've got that's especially no good for people that might be using their dog for birds as well and that might want to get into retrieving. Anything going along that line of things um, where a dog is picking something up and running around, doesn't want to bring it back to you, is, is obviously terrible for retrieving. Um, my final note is how I would deal with it. So that that jumping up, um, obviously if you continue doing the scent work and the dog's taking you to it, part of doing scent work is you are setting it up so you know exactly where it is. So if the dog goes to walk past the wind scent or past the ground scent and it doesn't go after it because it doesn't realise that that's something that you want it to do, you can pull it up and send it down that way anyway. You know, And that's why in the blueprint we do it later on in training. Once we have all the tools of our nice walk in front and our change of direction and our turn and our stop and our go, if the dog walks past it or it drifts off a ground scent or a wind scent, we can actually use our turn command, bring the dog back to us and then give our, we, we also have a directional, basically wherever we point and give our go command. Um, I use a double peep whistle as my go command. I can basically point in any direction and say point, do that and the dog will walk in that direction. So I've basically got like remote control dog and on those early skin scents, if the dog's getting a little bit lost on it, you can actually step in. Both my dogs have just walked into the room now because I'm doing uh, my double peak whistles and stuff. Um, uh, you can help guide the dog into showing it what you want it to do. And that's the same thing later on in the field and all of that too. Having all of this stuff set up just helps massively gets the dog off to a really good start hunting. Um, so with her jump, with the, if, if, and I've had this a lot, right, and I've also had it, um, I remember having this with a dog that had had a really bad experience um, starting out retrieving. Um, it was a German short-haired pointer, and one of the very first times he'd gone into water, he had gone running into this pond and and got tangled up in all this weed and stuff. He went running into the water full blast, apparently. I, I think he didn't even realise the water was there. And this big German shorty pointer just went barreling into this water with like real deep weed and just hit the water full blast, went in under the water and got all tangled up in weed and stuff and had a hell of a time. And um, after that, they were having a real challenge Um getting him going, retrieving. He was sort of scared of the water and stuff. And um, I did all sorts of stuff with that dog. Um, I was also training him as a deer dog too. Was, this was back in the day when I used to do um, deer dog boot camps. and and But I was also working on, on his retrieving at the same time. And um, I was taking him out and taking him out into the water and like getting in the water and holding him up and swimming him around and doing all this stuff. But um, I, then I also started doing the scent work and I had a lump of frozen deer skin and deer skin actually um, floats really, really well because deer hair is, is, is it's a hollow fibre. Um, you know, pe- fly fishermen use it on um, fishing flies because it's every deer hair is hollow with air inside it so it floats really well. So a, a lumped up lump of deer skin actually floats like a cork. Um. And I started doing skin work with this dog and that was one of the first times that I really started seeing him get keen. You know, it was a bit funny and wishy-washy early on with it and then, um, and and but I'd done a lot of long, long line work with him before that. So I had his walk in front, my go command, my turn and I guided him through a 
through a few sessions of skin work and uh, he was just a bit of a funny sort of a sulky drop lip sort of a dog you know and I was trying to get him going and um, he started getting the skin the, the skin scent stuff a bit and I'd give him a big pat you know good boy trying to build him up and get him like you know, get him stoked and going. And um, then one day, we were walking back towards the house after doing a skin drag, and he's just walking next to me and he at heel sort of thing. And he sort of started getting a bit of a trot on and started bouncing around a bit and got all playful, and he grabbed the piece of skin out of my hand as I was walking. Um, and I actually used that to get him going, you know, and I let, and then, so I didn't tell him off, and I let him take it out of my hand, and he carried it all the way back to the house, um, and I actually cut a small piece off it, and put it in his kennel with him, and he chewed it to bits and stuff, and then the next skin drag, he, he did really well, and long story short, I, I ended up building from that, and snowballing it forward, to, until the point where I started getting him retrieving deer skin out of the water um and then i did a whole bunch of other stuff and long story short he actually ended up being um, quite a good duck dog and deer dog last time i heard from that so um uh, and i've seen it a lot before you know when dogs do still want the skin or they get to it and they don't want to let it go and things like that um so if i was in your situation and, and if if my We'll put it this way, if your dog is keen enough and confident enough and forward enough that it's grabbing it and trying to be possessive over it and it's trying to jump up and take it out of your hand, um, you should be fine to put quite a bit of pressure on that. you know. And um, remember that our principle of pressure and praise, um, the, at the timing and measure of the application and releasing of pressure and praise, so if the dog takes you into it and gets to it, um, it's all good and you're praising the dog, nice calm praise. And that's all in the blueprint there and doing the skin work, um, including slowing the dog down and making them stop and wait. You should be able to uh, get your dog to take you in, give it a stop command like two metres before the skin, and then you walk around and take the skin off the peg and or pick it up off the ground if it's a wind scent. And, uh, oh, excuse me, pick it up off the ground if it's a um, ground scent and uh, show it to the dog, give the dog some calm praise. If the dog tries to grab it, say, ah, cut it out. Just that, it's, it's just that, that command of disapproval. You've got it on a long line. You could control it on the long line. Um, and then, but it's always that pressure and praise and the application and releasing of pressure and praise. So if the dog tries to bite it, you go, ah, cut it out and, and walk off. And as soon as you're walking and the dog isn't biting it again, you know, you're just walking without the dog trying to jump up say good dog if it tries to jump up and bite it you say ah cut it out and then as soon as it's walking again you say good dog release that pressure praise releases pressure so if you go cut it out get out of it and keep walking as soon as the dogs walk normally for two or three seconds you can just say it without stopping and patting the dog or anything just saying good dog and keep walking and that good dog releases the pressure that you just put on it when it was trying to jump and bite it shouldn't be too complicated you know and and it's the same with it grabbing it and running off um you're saying i kept giving her command of disapproval but she kept doing it <sighs> you know it's quite an extreme situation and relatively uncommon particularly with a well-trained dog, everything going through it step by step. Even you know, And if you're at the point of the blueprint where you're doing skin work, you should be getting pretty close to this, where you can 
you know, give the com- dog a good command of disapproval and it'll stop. Um, you say she also picks it up and runs away and gets really possessive of it and won't bring it back unless I pull her in on the long line. So, yeah, that that's getting pretty over the top. Um, I wouldn't growl the dog for picking it up. I would want to, um, and I would just go right back to the basics on that. Um, if the dog picks it up, I wouldn't start growling it. If the dog picks it up and tries to start moving away, I would tend to go for to into a recall rather than a instead of no ah growling the dog because that's not really a command, right? I would go into either a stop command or a recall command. That's really what I would do. I wouldn't growl a dog for picking up a bit of deer skin. Picking it up's fine. Um, but the dog's got to stop or come to me when I say while it's holding the bit of deer skin. Um, she runs away and get really gets really possessive. Yeah, so that's, that's actually a big tip there. That's not in my notes. I didn't really think of that until I started talking through it here. Um, but that's what I would do. And, you know, if you've got you've got the dog on the long line, so you've got all of the normal tools you use for the stop or recall there. Um, and so if, the, if a dog had picked up a piece of skin and was moving away from me, I wouldn't start growling it and giving it a command disapproval, um, I'd just give a stop command and stand on the long line and then walk down the long line. And if it wasn't sitting, I would push its bum down. And as soon as it's sitting, I'd just pat it and say, good dog. Um, or I would give it its recall command. For example, in the blueprint early on for print, I was just using hair print. Um, and later on, it was basically the turn command, which is basically hair print and a whistle. Um, I would just give my recall and stay dead pan. I wouldn't growl or nothing. I would, and exactly how you start training a recall in the blueprint right from a pup, I would give my recall. If the dog didn't listen, I would maybe give it once more maximum. Uh and then if the dog still wasn't coming in, I would pull it in with the long line. I'm not c- giving it command of disapproval. I'm not growling or nothing. I'm just here print. And then the second one would pretty much be just to um, reconfirm or get across what I'm wanting at the time as I start pulling him in on the long line. So I'd go here print, and then I'd go here print as I start pulling him in, and I'd just pull him in. Um, gently deadpan and then as soon as he's next to me uh, all the pressure would come off and I'd start giving him a pat if he started to pull away I'd pull him back in as soon as he's back in I'd release the pressure Um, you know it's it's as simple as that and it's it's really the execution of those principles and techniques and proper execution and really trying to stay away from conflict and too much, um, you know, cut it out, get it out of it, ah, all that sort of stuff. You can usually avoid 99% of that by just always going back to the basics, using your commands properly, using the long line properly, and really thinking about it, you know, and trying to stay calm and go back to those fundamentals. Um, you know, if you, and, and once you, uh, this is really a, a huge part of what good dog training is and, and what a good dog trainer does and utilizes and, and is constantly doing. And there's all of these different sort of iterations of it, right? There's all of these different ways that you can sort of be in the same system, but do things a little bit different, react to things in different ways using the same set of things, but in different combinations, different orders, and in different ways, and end up going off down a completely different track. And, and a dog's 
doing something over and over and you're getting into conflict and growling and too many commands of disapproval when you could have just gone right back to the basics and just hair print and pull them in. Keep calm, quiet. Uh, remember, it's always a minimum amount of pressure or praise required to get the job done and flip it. And you're always trying to flip it straight from minimum amount of pressure required to let the dog know what you want it to do and to help it to do what you want it to do in the time. help You're trying to help the dog to do what is required at the time and then praising it for doing what you want it to do. You're, or that's, that's the way you're always trying to skirt around it. Command of disapproval and pressure doesn't get it done it, and it can turn into conflict and silly games and it really can and that can actually create like the dog getting possessive and grabbing it and trying to go away. If you're not giving it the positive alternative, showing it how to do it and then praising it for doing it, you can really head off down a bit of an ugly path where the dog doesn't actually know what to do and it turns into a bit of a game and stuff like that. Um, you got to be really careful with all that sort of stuff. And, and again, I've said it about five times, but always go back to those those principles and using your commands like that's why like with a stop go and turn a stop go and turn um stop go turn and recall like if you've got those four you can pretty much do anything you know, and, and you can stop any problem before it starts. Um, you can literally stop the go, the dog, stop it, tell it to go, tell it to come back, and tell it to turn. It's like remote control dog. And and the importance of that sort of thing is when the dog does pick up a bit of deer skin or something, you just use your stop command or call it back. It's a classic example of... Uh, good basic control fixing any other problem um, on all of these guys like usual uh, always really encourage you know updates from people if I'm answering this question you know a few weeks later which I often am and I give a big answer um, and I've missed something or I've interpreted something a little bit wrong let me know again um send us a message, put a comment on another post, um, letting us know, and even give us an update just how you're getting on. Uh, next question, Hayden. Um, Hi, Paul, I've just started the blueprint with my 11-week-old pup. When we train in the morning, she's really attentive and does really well with the come commands. However, when we train after work, she seems to get easily distracted and chases leaves and eats grass and isn't very responsive to any command. And I seem to only get her attention when I pull on the long line. Any tips on keeping her attention or is this just a thing with young pups and will get better with time? So these questions, uh, I put a post up in the Big Game Indicating Dogs in a Circle Facebook page. And the Big Game Indicating Dogs in a Circle is a closed private Facebook group where, with only people that are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint go in there. Um, and it's it's a really cool community where pe some people have been following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint and had it for a number of years and have trained multiple dogs on the Blueprint. And then when new members turn up and have a question like this, week 11, so he's had the blueprint for three weeks when there's people in there that have had the blueprint for five years and Hayden asked the question in there and, and you get a lot of really good uh, replies, not only not just from me but from loads of other people that have followed the blueprint as well. And I've spoken about this before in Q&As where the quality of some of the advice in there now is easily just as good as what I could have given um, but you're getting it from loads of different people, loads of different perspectives, loads of different people in different situations. Um, it's really, really cool. 
And this reply from Devin is, I couldn't have written this any better myself. <clears throat> Devin said straight away, replied to this question in the inner circle, part one is just linking actions to commands. You shouldn't be putting any pressure on your pup to do it. Keep training nice and light and prioritise building a bond with your pup and making sure it's a positive thing. Devin says this is his own experience here and in hindsight, through you know, a lot of experience of his own, he says, I was way too harsh on my pup early on thinking I could get through the blueprint quicker, but it doesn't work like that. <laughs> and that's so true, man. Um, so basically in part one, which you're still on part one with an 11-week-old pup. Um, we, we don't do compliance work in part one. We, we you know work with the pup on the long line, but it's basically just getting the pup out of the kennel and letting it run around and move. Um, and we just bond with the pup and do a little bit of work with it, just linking actions to commands and some very light work. Um, we're not really going for compliance. If the pup starts doing anything wrong, jumping up and biting us and things, we're more likely to disengage and walk away and then try again in a, in a moment. Um, and it's not until part two we start some very gentle compliance work, but it's it's very gentle, a little bit of pressure if the pup starts biting and jumping up and things like that. And we start working on trying to get a sit drill happening, like a one or two second sit. Um, quite often... If with with the right pup and if you handle those first four weeks, even though we're not doing going for serious compliance work, um, we quite often get the beginnings of some pretty tidy sit sit and come and stuff like that in part one. But if the pup's not getting it, you know, we don't start putting a lot of pressure on the pup to do it either. Um, so I think what Devin said there is perfect. Part one's just linking actions to commands. You shouldn't be putting any pressure on your pup. Keep training nice and light and prioritise building a bond with your pup and make sure it's a positive thing. And he said he's, he was way too harsh, put way too much pressure on his pup early on, thinking you'd do it quicker. It doesn't work like that, you know. And this comes up again later on too, just really trusting the process. Um, you know, the blueprint is, is a 12-month system minimum, really. Some people can do it a little bit quicker, and, and later on I'm going to talk about how in some cases it's going to be much longer than 12 months too with some dogs. And um, you can really make it tough by trying to rush it, trying to put too much pressure on a pup or dog, trying to push the outcome too, too hard, harder than what you should versus just slowing down and taking a step back, trusting the process, sticking to those basics really well. It's a really good example going back to what I was talking about um, with the picking up the deer skin thing and how you can go straight to, ah, cut it out and like command a disapproval versus just using a command and then using the long line techniques to back the command up and just keeping your tone flat sit, hair print, and if he doesn't come, use the long line. You know, the more you escalate, the more tension you can bring into training and, and you can go down that negative path. Um, you're far better off using the long line and techniques. Um, my notes here is Devin said it perfectly. Does Devin want to take over doing the Q&A podcast? <laughs> uh, but seriously, um, it's definitely an age thing too, you know. Um, Hayden said, any tips on keeping her attention or is this just a thing with young pups that will get better with time? Yeah, it really will just get better with time and you're better off really, you know, again, going back to that principle of training is really trying, not making the pup or dog do what you want it to do, it's really trying to help it to do what you want it to do. You know, the more clear you can make it, and man, they don't, dogs do not have a high IQ, eh? Even the smartest dog on the planet has the IQ of about a three-year-old kid. And it's very easy to 
overestimate what they can understand and to think, oh, the dog knows what to do and it's just doing it because it doesn't want to and you, so you switch to command of disapproval um, and putting pressure on the dog when so often what we really need to do is just stay really calm, keep our, our the tone of our voice neutral, uh, give our commands and use proper technique to help the dog to understand what we're trying to do. And, and usually when we start getting into conflict over and over, we're expecting too much or we're doing something wrong. You know, and, and um, just trusting in the process and being patient and trying to keep uh, training sessions calm and positive and just rinse and repeat and, and make haste slowly you know, is the best way to go. You're far better off um, having a fun and calm and relaxed 15 or 18 months of training than than pushing like hell and trying to do it in 10 months, you know. You honestly are. Um, and, 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 you know, the more dogs you train and, and, and the more experience you get and the further you get down the track and turn around and look back in hindsight, and I'm talking months and months and years and years and then multiple dogs and get decades down it, the more you look back and go, man, I, we just need, I just needed more time. I just needed to chill out and just give that, that whole thing more time and just enjoy it, you know, and really stick to my my basics and fundamentals and just do my part right and just keep keep my cool and and just train the try to help the dog you know that that's really what it's about try to help them understand you know how you can work together and and how they can do it properly and and um you're always trying to just help the dog to understand how to do it properly so you can praise them for doing it properly so they realise, oh, that's what you wanted me to do, you know. Um, and undoubtedly uh, pressure comes into that. But, you know, if the pup tries to get up off a stop drill, we don't just say nothing and, and ask them to sit again. If a pup gets up off a stop drill, we go, ah, push it back down and then good dog, praise it. If it's only just learning how to do a stop, stop, we don't step back five steps and try to test it. Then no, when it does it wrong. If it's only just getting it and it gets up off a stop drill, we go up, ah, put it back, and it sits for two and a half seconds or a second and a half. Then we say good pup, step back, get another second and a half and release it and say good pup again while it's walking away. You know, it's all about helping the dog to execute things correctly. So we can praise it for doing that, which is building its confidence, built, uh, letting it know that it's doing the right thing. Pressure's only ever to let the dog know, ah, hey, that's not what we're doing here. Adjustment, good dog, this is what we're doing. Really important. Uh... Yeah, and it's definitely an age thing that will get better over time. Some more notes I've got on this is it seem odd it seems odd that the pup is really good in the morning and not in the afternoon. It does. I've never really come across that. One note I've got here on this is that it's summer at the moment here in New Zealand, or actually it's early autumn, but we've just been in summer. This question was asked in summer. And I said that uh, training can be really difficult when it's hot. Um, it can slow fast dogs down. It can also make them not into it at all. And when it's hot and you're trying to get them to stop and sit and they're in direct sun and you're like, hey, sit, stay there. And all they want to do is get up and move and get into the shade. I've seen that. Um, doing one on like uh, doing one on ones in the middle of the afternoon in the middle of a hot summer's day right out in the open is is uh, is damn near hopeless actually it really is and you're trying to do a sit drill and the dog's like <laughs> it's getting all hot and wants to sit down and it's heading for shade and they're just not interested in what you've got to say 
when you've got them stuck out in the heat. Um, yeah, that that's quite a biggie. That um, so that's one note. Is it is it cool in the morning, and then in the afternoon when you get home from work because it's still pretty bloody hot at five or six o'clock some days in January and February. Um, are you out in the heat doing that, and the dog's just not into it? That can be a big factor. Um, but again, back to Devin. This is my final note on this. Back to Devin, Devin's comment. Uh, that really stands out as a biggie here. Time of patience, and you're not going for compliance with an 11 week old pup anyway. Uh, David, hi, started the blueprint recently with a 12 week old Vizsla. He's really good with recall command, but with his stops, he seems to think my hand is a chew toy and will spin around trying to grab at my hand when pushing his bum down. Also, after a few minutes or so, he starts grabbing at the top of my gum boot when we are walking around. Should I just ignore this behavior and walk off? Um, my reply in the comments here, so I've replied to this um, in the inner circle. I've said, yep, command of disapproval and move off. Then try and engage with the pup and praise it when it's calm with all four feet on the ground and not biting. So pressure on what we don't want and praise on what we do want. If a pup starts biting my hand or biting my gum boot, I just go, ah, maybe give it a little shove away and I turn and walk away. So I'm just dising, just command disapproval right on the button as soon as the pup does it, disengage, walk away, and just the fact of me walking will generally get a pup's all four feet on the ground and walking and I don't care if it's still walking and before it even has time to slow down and catch up and think about biting my boot. So I'll go from the pup biting up, I'll take five, three or four steps even. And while the pup's still catching up, I'm bending down saying good pup and patting it. So in a very roundabout way, the pup's got commanded disapproval and me walking away from biting. And then I'm patting it uh, while it's not biting me. That's all I'm trying to achieve there is command of disapproval and disengagement for the bite. And I'm just trying to dive in and get the opportunity of I'm re-engaging with the pup uh, while it's not biting. And if as soon as it catches up and as soon I might get half a good pup and get a hand on it for half a second, as soon as it turns to bite my hand again, I'm disengaging and walking away. And I'll just do that over and over. I don't care if it, if and every time, if the pup just wants to bite me every single time, then I'll just spend the whole session walking away from it. Um, you know, and, and they can go through that bloody period for a couple of weeks. And if you're really good with all of that stuff, and you should, you should get times, um, when you can engage with it, always disengage, but command a disapproval as well when they do bite. Ah, and just, I'm talking like when I say shove a pup away, it's like a, it's like with the with your fingers, you know, it's just like ah, and and if if it's because it's got its face, it's biting your hand right, um, so it's biting your fingers. It's just a flick with the fingers, a little shove with the ah, and walk away, um. And even if you, you, you know, you might be able to engage with it when it gets distracted and it's like sniffing on the ground or picking up a leaf or something, just good pup, give it a pat there. Um, pat it while it's eating its biscuits later on. Stuff like that, you know. And every time it bites, disengage, command of disapproval. Um, and every time you can, pat it while it's calm. And they click on pretty quick, you know. Um... 12 week old, so yeah, so you're just at the start of being able to do a little bit of light compliance work too. Um, <clears throat> David's gone on to say here, so I replied that, um, David said, cheers, yeah, I've basically listened to all of the Q&As now, should have done that before I asked the question. He said he's he's come a lot better but still having his moments, and yeah, it's pretty common, you know. Um, but male, like any dog can do it. Male Vizsla, 
Um, they can be pretty full on and take a little bit slower maturing and a bit more work. Um, my reply, uh, more notes. So again, it's a really young dog here too. Um, I've talked about the application and releasing of pressure and praise. Engaging and disengaging are really important with this type of thing too. Engaging whenever you can when the pup's calm and not biting or all four feet on the ground. Uh, disengaging as soon as it starts biting. Um, if you do all of that right, and you, this is my final note on this, if you're doing all of that right and you're not doing a bunch of other stuff that's undoing all of your good work, this should come right pretty quickly. And that's a big one too. Um, you know, we talk about kids playing with pups and all that sort of thing. Um, if your kids are spending an hour and a half a day rolling around screaming with the pup climbing all over them, clawing them and biting at their clothes and doing all that, and then you you try to spend 10 minutes twice a day disen, you know, engaging and disengaging, you're not going to undo all of that other stuff, you know. So that's and it's a it's really important that um, it's hard to out train a bunch of other crazy stuff that's happening outside of training. You can't you can't actually. Um, so if you do if you do everything right and you're not doing a bunch of other stuff that's undoing all your good work, it should come right pretty quickly. Another note, and I think this comes up again later on, is um, a bit of patience too, you know, and and um, again, as mentioned early on in the blueprint part one, talking about choosing a pup or dog, some dogs and some breeds do take longer. They take more training and longer to mature. Um, a Vizsla is definitely in that category for me. Um you know, Miko took longer than Print did, for example. Miko was the forward confident one of the litter. She's also a Vizsla. Um, heading dogs are really well known for um, being easy to train and easy to handle and fast maturing and all of that. And if you get pick a nice, calm, quiet heading dog, they're even better. Um Labradors are pretty high up there for me for nice temperament, fast maturing, um, easy to get along with, easy to train. Um, GSPs, Vizslas, German wire hair pointers, Drathars, uh, things like that um, uh, often take more work, slower maturing, and they just take more time. They really do, honestly. Um Miko was just slower with a lot of things. She was she was smart, they're smart, um, and they learned some things really quickly. And Miko got pretty tidy with all of this stuff early on. Miko's main thing was getting her smooth off the long line, you know, whereas Print was getting really good off the long line around 12, 14, 15 months old. Um... Miko was sort of two, two and a bit before she was at the same mark. There was about a six or eight month time period in there where I was like, man, I've done everything. She knows everything. It was just in her head, her maturing. Um, she was just a, a little bit more full on and took more time to settle down into that. And, you know, I was like, man, she sort of looks ready to let her off the long line, but then she had a couple of moments. She chased a seagull down the beach and she chased a pukeko out in the paddock and I sort of went back and forth a little bit, put her back on the long line, did a heap of work, went back and forth, and, and but really all it was with her was time. And it was just not, uh, not setting her up to fail, you know, not putting her in a bunch of situations where she was repeatedly chasing so it really become a habit. And I just sort of had to back off a little bit, be patient and just just like man manage her well, you know, like take her for walks, um, let her off the long line when we when we were in the right environment um, without those triggers there. And then any time I thought we might get around those triggers, you know, like birds busting out of, um, cover and rabbits and different stuff like that get her back on the long line and just managed her well for another few months and she did man she really clicked day eh? and um, 
when I keep saying this is this will come up again later on in this Q and A, I'm sort of going into it now. Um, I really did have that phase with Miko where I'd sort of done everything that I'd done um, with print and she'd had the same sort of level of management and she'd reached the same age and I was at that point like thinking, well, print was ready by now. Why aren't you ready? And uh, it's, she's a different dog, you know, and, and um, heading dogs are famous for that really level-headed, really biddable, always wanting to please. And Miko just had more of this independent, uh, excitable streak where she just wanted to blast and go and do stuff. And um, and and you could say, like, nine months, I've got to wait another, I've been training for a year, and now you've got to tell me another nine months. Um, but it, go, it's a, it goes surprisingly quick too, you know. And... Um, and that's just what it is, you know, with some dogs. And, and you know, we, we, you see, um, we see this in the Q&As and in the inner circles and things, and people are well aware of it. You see it in comments, people helping each other out in the inner circle. Someone will say, man, I've got, I'm doing this with my GSP, and I've been doing it for ages, and it's just taken, I don't know, he's still not ready yet. And people are saying, yep, my GSP took a lot longer too, and it just took time. I stuck on it, and it's really he's really starting to come right now. Um, the inner circle is a real cool support group like that, and um, so that's something I, I did want to cover off in this Q and A is just that time thing, and um, if things aren't happening as quickly as you want to, by getting frustrated and going down that path of lots of commands of disapproval, lots of um, pressure and conflict. You can be digging yourself a bit of a hole and make it really hard work and unenjoyable. If you can take a step back and going, okay, screw it, I'm I'm gonna. You might be trying to get your dog ready for the raw, which is coming up, or ready for a hunting trip in the winter that you've got that's three months away. Um, and it can be bloody annoying and stressful when you're gonna have the dog for a long time. You know, it's that patience thing. And is it really going to matter? And if you look back in five years' time, and you go the difference between starting this winter or starting after, you know, closer to Christmas, and still starting in spring, and I'm stressing myself out, and it's not going well. What if I just give myself a heap more time here? Just take a step back and try to enjoy it, and keep it chill. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I forgot even what the question was that I started on here. Um, anyway, that's what these Q and A's are all about. Uh, Liam, he's in Australia, fifteen month old GSP bitch. Just a quick question as to what people are doing hunting wise in the hotter months with dogs that they're finished with the blueprint uh, I'm in Australia and as most people know there is a ton of snakes I still train my dog and have been teaching her some new stuff in the water etc but not too sure what to do in regards to hunting in the drive for deer so yeah this is a common one in Australia um, really it, it's seen you know and it's not something I'm personally experienced with I haven't um, hunted in Australia I don't have a lot of experience over there but from what I can gather a lot of guys over there just um, down tools in summer for both themselves and the dogs want the you know the in winter the snakes aren't are nowhere near as active in summer um, going out in the bush they particularly taking a dog out in the bush when the when the snakes are active in the warmer months is it's really is risky um, you know a dog just blundering around through the bush it's it's bloody dangerous apparently um so he's pretty much just talking about downing tools not taking the dog hunting for a few months over the summer and what do you do you know i've got this bloody dog and it's concerning i've got this dog to hunt and i'm just gonna it's just gonna be a pet for a few months um 
how is this going to go? And I think that I think this particular one about the snakes has been asked. Um, this about the dog having a break um, has definitely been asked with people having injuries and lockdowns and different things. But I think it has been asked specifically about the summer, the snake and summer thing in Australia. Um, my my question, my reply straight away in the comments and this was. Um, Having a few months off shouldn't be a big deal. Just do what you're doing. Give the dog walks and swims, etc. Keep it safe and happy. Then when it cools off again and it's safe, start hunting again. They handle the break really well and go back to it good as gold. And they really do. I've done this many times um, in my life where I've had a dog and for whatever reason I just haven't hunted bugger all for a few months. And um, even longer than a few months I've had dogs that, that I haven't hunted in a year or so. And um, you take them back out and they, they pick it up just like just like you would. You know, you don't forget how to hunt a deer and walk around in the bush and shoot it and stuff. The dogs are exactly the same. Um, they handle it really well. They handle a break really well once you've laid down a solid foundation. Like once, if you've followed the blueprint... Um, and even if you fin you're finishing the blueprint leading up to summer and you're like, yeah, I think my dog's ready. I could probably start hunting now, but you can't, This that's going to be what? Um, well, the whole summer off, a few, four or five months, three, four months. I don't know how long you've actually got to wait in Aussie. Um, just, it, it's another version of what I was just saying. Just keep going. Just keep the dogs only going to get better. They do. They really do. They get better and better as they age. They really do, man. And you know, Miko had that phase of six or eight months. I was like, man, what's she? What's she doing here? What have I done? I did everything right, and and uh, she just switched her ears off and chased a bloody. You know, her recall was good. She had and her stop was good. I know she knew. But her mentally, she wasn't there yet, just maturity-wise. And she still had that ability to just switch her ears off and go. Six or eight months later, she was just arriving at the point where you know, she wouldn't do it. Um, and I could call her back if she thought about breaking. Um, another eight, month, eight or 12 months further on down the track, she, she basically won't even break now. She'll just, you know, lock up. And on the bird stuff, um, you know, because she will go if I send her because I've done retrieving and stuff with her. Um, I say, way you go, and she'll go, even on a wounded bird, so that which is basically the same as, you know, chasing a seagull or a poo kicker across the paddock or up the beach. Um but the older they get, the better they, they get. You know, I'm sure I've told a story about um, Tessa, uh, a, a Labrador that I had, and I can't remember what it was. Um, I spent all that time, uh, well, I got Tessa while I was living in the bush full time trapping possums. And um, we spent a lot of time in the bush together, did a huge amount of hunting. And. Uh, then I stopped. I wasn't living in the bush full time. I was doing all sorts of other stuff. And um, I remember one time, just for whatever reason, and, and I do this, you know, I've done a lot of hunting throughout my life. It's not as if, um, yeah, every now and again, I won't go hunting for a couple of months. And I can't remember how it worked out with her. I think we'd maybe done one or two hunts here or there. We might not have shot much, but it did. It really, We really racked up some time where we didn't do much hunting for several months. And I didn't even think about it, to be honest. This is years ago. And then uh, I went to go out. I think actually, too, we had been in the bush a bit, but we'd just been trapping. I wasn't really targeting deer. I think that's what it was. We'd still been in the bush. Every now and again, I was taking the gun, shooting the odd deer off the trap line and things. I think that's what it was. It was, And, and I remember going out hunting one day, and thinking, man, this is the first time, like, without traps. So no traps set. I wasn't pre-feeding. I wasn't carrying traps out. I wasn't. And I think I I'd even had, I hadn't even trapped for a month or two. And then I was like, man, I'm going to go for a hunt, like a proper deer stalk. And, and I went out with just the dog and the rifle and a day pack. 
and I thought this is the first time I've done a proper just dedicated hunt in a long time with Tessa I wonder how she's going to go and she was awesome she was really good and that was when she was about five or six I'm pretty sure and um uh she just hit an age they they do they hit an uh, you know dogs have exactly like uh, like people too um you go through these different phases you know you, you're a pup and then the, they're a pup and then um they hit five or six months old they start learning stuff and doing it and you can see your commands coming through eight nine ten months old they're really starting to tidy up and get good 12 or 15 months old a, a, a nice calm dog of of a certain breed like print and the blueprint you guys saw that um by 12 and 15 months old he was getting really nice and hunting over him off the long line and all of that um then some dogs as you hunt more over them and they they might be approaching two years old they hit that real confident phase where they're hunting like mad and they almost know too much but they're not a old mature wise dog yet and they can almost be a little bit more of a handful for a while still good but a little bit more of a handful and then they hit three and they're getting better three four years old and then they get to like five or six and you haven't done any more training you haven't even been doing tons of hunting but they're just getting older and they start doing stuff uh, and you just see it out on the bush one day and you're like holy shit that was cool they did a real solid lock up and they just went they slowed right down they went really slow uh, at a time where maybe a, a year ago they you would have been um, using your quiet hiss command to try and slow them down they might have been pushing their range but now that's now you're almost Tessa reached a point where she got annoyingly slow going in you know, and she'd lock up and stop, and she she really clicked that we could spook them and screw it up, and if we go slowly and carefully, we had a way better chance. Um, and if she could smell a direct wind really close, like it's right there, it's close enough that we could spook it, um, and sometimes she'd just lock up, and I couldn't see the freaking thing, and I'd stand there for ages and kneel down and look around and wait and look and listen, and I just couldn't see it, and nothing was happening, and I had to go in closer, but she wouldn't move. And I'd have to, like, I'm trying to quietly give my double peep. And she's still not going off the double peep. And I'd almost, like, step up behind her and, like, push her on the bum to get her to move and go in a bit more to see if we can get eyes on it. Um, so, you know, yeah, quite often they, they, they'll be better after more time even if you're not hunting they definitely get better at hunting and finding deer the more hunting you do um sometimes they get more and more confident and more of a handful up to a certain point and then through more experience and more hunting and sometimes just time and maturing they get better and better as well um So back to my notes on this, um, <clears throat> they handle a they handle a break really really well once you have a solid foundation. Um, this is a huge one here. The really important thing is not to do a bunch of crazy stuff too early that will undo your good work. You know, um, and I've also got here once the right dog is old enough and well set up they can handle lots of freedom and time off and st step back into hunting really well and that's where my dogs are at now you know prince like six um miko's three or four and uh yeah they're good they're good you know they can have a lot of freedom cruise around they never really do anything crazy they don't break and chase stuff and you know, so I can walk it. I've got to, we've had some trees cut down out in the paddock here, and I can go out there with them off the long line, and I'm picking up branches and loading up the trailer and just cruising around. And I barely even have to think about them. And every now and again, I think, oh, what are the dogs doing? And I look around, and Prince just laying down over there, and Miko sniffing around over there. You know, um, 
Later on, we've got a question and someone's asking about once my dog's fully trained, can I take it out for a run? Of, and she's also into horses. Can I ride my horse and have my dog run with me off the long line? You can definitely do that once the dog's trained and old enough, you know. And some dogs will need more time to be able to handle that without, uh, you know, without losing it. Um, other dogs will get will be able to handle that sooner. Other dogs will need more time. But all dogs, if managed right and given enough time to mature, will be able to do that. You know, and and um, I've talked about my e-bike before. You know, and and at the moment I'm spending quite a lot of time in the country. I've also lived in in the middle of town for the last few years. Uh, busy town. And um, now both of my dogs, I can go out on the e-bike and ride through all the parks and pull up to the road and they'll, and they'll stop, um, look for cars, no, no cars, give them my go command and, and they'll run across the road while I ride across the road through a bit more park, all off the long line. And there's ducks and poo along these waterways and stuff in Papamo and there's ducks and poo kikos and other people and dogs and stuff everywhere. Um and they're good as gold, and we can go for a massive big, I'll do a like a 10k loop on the e-bike, you know, often I'm doing about 15, 20k's an hour, giving the dogs a really good run, um, so you can do all of that stuff, um, and they can handle a big break really well, as long as they're all set up well, you've got that good foundation in place, and you don't do a bunch of crazy stuff too early, um, they really can, you know. Toby, my papa's just turned five months old, GSP Vizsla. Sometimes on a stop, she'll get up and bark at me and mouth my hand. I use a command of disapproval, tug on the long line, and put her back on a sit by pushing her bum down. I have to do this a lot sometimes to finish the drill five to ten times. For example, I did four stops today and only once did she do this. Is it best to stay calm and keep giving her the command of disapproval, ramping it up the longer she plays up and pushing her bum down until she does the whole drill, which is what I've been doing? Or is it just best to move off and carry on walking as sometimes I feel like I should? Also, it doesn't happen every session, once, maybe twice a week. She goes fine apart from this. She is a full-on... She is a full-on pup on part three. Um, yeah, so pretty early days here still, man. On part three, it's still early days of the stop drill. Um, man... It's pretty rare for that to be this really intense thing that keeps coming up over and over all the time. Uh, it's definitely not rare for it to happen occasionally, um, for sure, and right at the stage that you're at now too. Early, early phase of going for, early days of going for compliance in the stop drill. So part three, five months old, we're really at the point now where once we start a stop drill, we're not uh, we're not ending that drill until the pup does a proper stop. Um, and you say, is it so far? I've been I've been you've been staying in there, ramping it up, ramping up the pressure for as long as it takes, basically to get to finish the drill, finish the drill. And, and not letting the pup get away from it. And you say, is it best to just move off and carry on walking? Or some? So you're saying basically start a stop drill, the pup keeps getting up, it's getting turning into a bit of drama and just going, okay, then you win and ditch bail out on the stop drill. I don't reckon definitely don't do that. Um, definitely don't do that. And that's why it's so important that you've got to be really careful with what you ask a dog to do and how you do it because um, like starting a stop drill 
and then bailing out on it, not carrying through with that drill properly to the end, is teaching the dog that it doesn't have to listen to you. And if you do that, it's going to keep doing it over and over. And once you do that a few times, the dog's going to know that forever. And it could pop up again later on, you know. Um, so it's really important. And that's actually a real fundamental principle of dog training is that stop means stop and stay stopped until told to go and there's nothing else. You know, and that's really how you want to train it too. It's really, if the dog wants to get going again, the best way to do that is to stop and stay and wait. And and which brings me to a, a really good key is, um, you know, going back to that, if the dog, that and that's really it. It's a reverse psychology thing. You're flipping the whole thing around. The longer the dog mucks around for, the longer it's going to be there with you telling it to sit, stop, stay and wait. And as soon as it does it correctly, you'll release it to go. So it's really important, particularly if you start running into issues like this and you're in early days as well. Keep it super simple and easy and very short stop drills, man. Um, nice and short and don't start to test the dog and push your luck. Make haste slowly. Um, your super early days on part three, I've just had that that talk about um, you're way better off to take a little bit longer with your training and have it fun and positive and cruisy and you'll get a better result too if you're really trying to push your luck and speed things up. Um you can really run into trouble like that, you know. And this is a perfect example of it. Um, if you're trying to push your stop drills, maybe you're trying to do too many. Um, three or four drills in a 15, 20-minute session heaps. That's fine. Particularly if you're getting into trouble with them. Um, that's a real reading and measure thing. Um, if the drills are going really well and the dog seems to be enjoying them and you can do a, little, a few more, um, if it's early days and anything's a little bit shaky or you're running into any trouble, shorten them right up and just do very minimum amount um, and, and make haste slowly. And, and you, you want to build a nice, smooth, solid foundation, you know. Uh, man, give me, give me two or three, you know, four-second stop drills where I say sit. And the dog, I don't care if the if the pup just stops walking when I say sit, and I walk, and it, but it doesn't sit down. And I step in and say, "Good girl, push your bum down." As soon as her bum's down and she relaxes there, I'll say, "Good girl, give her a pat again." Step back, count and and wait like two seconds. Step back in, good girl. Another pat on the head. Take two steps to the left. Wait two seconds. <whistles> Go command. So there's basically four seconds of stop there. There's, I've said sit, stepped in, pushed the pup's bum down. From the time when I pat it there and step back, there's two seconds. Good dog, step back in, pat it, step back. Get another two seconds and release. You know, I'd take... I'd take three or four of those in a 20-minute session over... Um, and build on that and then keep it really positive and I'd be looking at the, the pup or dog's body language, wanting it to be happy and the stop drill should really turn into, hey, it's just time to stop and get a pat and then be released again. That's all it is, you know, and if the pup goes to go, I'm sort of like, hey, sit, I'm giving you a pat. This is our time for a pat. No, wait. Good girl. Okay. Good girl. You know, it's that. Um, and repetition of that. And and they get to the point where they, they like, forget to keep going. They just stop and then all of a sudden, oh, they've sat there for five seconds this time before they even thought about it. 
they got distracted and they were looking at a leaf blowing across the ground and then you got seven seconds and and they watched the leaf and then they snapped out of it and looked back to you and you go, good dog, and give the release. You know, and, and over time the dog's getting older and maturing and you're rinsing and repeating and trusting the process and taking your time and all of a sudden you're into these 30-second stop drills and you're walking further away. If you try to do too much too fast and the dog starts getting frustrated and annoyed and they start getting up and you get into these little battles, um, you can be prolonging the whole process and the quality of, of what you're doing is, le- is lower. You know? Um, and man, you'll get to a better place faster by doing it the other way, making haste slowly. You know, doing, do, you know, you want you want quality, not quantity, and and your quantity comes out of the quality. It's a real sort of chicken and egg situation there. Um, doing less shorter but tidy positive drills will have you doing more longer drills faster. Really important. Um, mm. So yeah, I've talked about balance on this and and, um, here's my notes. The balance on helping to get the dog right here. Like uh, yeah, you do need to use command of disapproval sometimes, but yeah, you re- I, I basically just hammered all that out. You really want to try and keep them short and sweet and smooth and use pressure when you have to, don't get me wrong, but um, you really want to lean on uh, keeping the need to use that to a minimum and going for that quality over quantity, Um, never test your dog. You never test, and you never push your luck, and you never, um, yeah, you never test your dog, never test, never push your luck. You're always just trying to build on what you already have. You're trying to start off on a positive way and build on that, and you're trying to build out in front of you, you know, um, and get the dog ready. If if wherever the limit is at where your dog might start to think about getting up or, hey, how far away is he going here? And it's starting to like, you know, when they'll be all relaxed in a sit drill and then you walk too far away and they sort of stiffen up and sit up a bit straighter and the ears prick up and they're like, what's he doing here? Wherever that is, you want to stay just back from that. You know, you want a bit out in front ahead of you. Um, and build out, that's what I mean by build out in front of you. Don't don't sort of try and get past that and turn around and look back and test for it. Um, you really get into trouble doing that and t- you take backward steps and um, shoot yourself in the foot. Um, make haste slowly, super early days on part three. Um, some dogs may, may take longer than print. Um, so if you're on part three and I was doing, um, I was stepping back further and moving more and doing longer stop drills and, and if you're getting into trouble with your dog trying to do that, um, GSP Vizsla Cross has the potential to be a pretty full-on pup that might take a bit longer than a really chill heading dog. Um, be prepared to take that time, you know, and try to, again, really try to make it enjoyable and cruisy for you and your dog. And if it's going to take longer, it's going to take longer. Um, yeah. Don't stress out about getting behind time-wise, you know. Um Yeah, and I've already talked about that quite a bit in this Q&A. 
April, just starting out with a pup, but would like to take her running and riding with me on my horse down the track when she is growing up. Will this hurt the training being put in? I know we're trying to teach them to walk slowly ahead, so concern that by taking a pup for runs or rides with my horse, I may be undoing this work. Getting ahead of myself at this stage, perhaps in part one still, the pup is very young, but interested to know. Um, so more, I've already touched on this earlier, but my notes on this is definitely okay later on when the dog is fully trained, within reason. There's a big sort of but there, within reason. Um, as long as it's all sensible and the dog's staying close and it's not starting to break and chase stuff and do some crazy stuff, if you, you're going out... I just explained that whole thing about me um, running my dogs on the e-bike, you know, through through all the parks and that. And sometimes they'll get 10 or 20 metres away from me running around and they're over there sniffing this or sniffing that while I'm riding around. But any time I can call them back, and I'm always keeping an eye on them and keeping it safe and all that, it's all within reason. You, Some of you guys would probably be quite surprised at how relaxed I am with my dogs and how much freedom they do get now that they're older and I know they can handle it. Um, but I've always talked about that in the blueprint because that was a lot of questions we get earlier on when people were saying, oh man, I'm, you know, this blueprint's pretty strict and the dog's always in the kennel, always in the long line, what can I do with the dog? So I have talked about that a lot. Um, but it's definitely okay later on once the dog is fully trained within reason as long as it's not creating a whole bunch of issues but the dog coming out you're riding the horse and the dog is um, running with you and just going for a run um, that's fine as long as it's not taking off and chasing stuff and breaking you know going crazy it's fine um, and I do it with my not with a horse but I do it with my dogs with, with the e-bike all the time <coughs> Um you know, and, and that, that, that the e-bike will do about 70 k's an hour, absolutely tapped, so it can go faster than what the dogs can run. And um, I don't, I don't run the the legs off my dogs really hard, but sometimes with the, you know, we'll often be cruising at 10 or 15 k an hour for quite a while, um, with faster bursts. So it's sort of the equivalent of like a as far, like I say, about as fast as the dog can run, you know. So just to give you an idea on sort of what I'm doing with my dogs and what you can do and have them still be fine, as long as they're still under control and um, they're sort of mentally connected with me, they're thinking about me and looking back and staying close and I'm keeping an eye on them. And um, if a poo kiko does go blasting right across the front of the dog or rabbits jump up right in front of them, I can say, Miko, and she'll stop. Um, I can recall them and all that sort of thing. It's totally fine. Um, it's all sort of common sense, you know, and within reason. Um, I've also said here it's definitely dodgy doing it too early while you're still training. You know, if if you haven't got all of your proper controls set up and you're not off the long line yet, um, I wouldn't do it with a dog, and I don't think you know. As far as undoing a bunch of training, and we we talk about you can undo training. You can also do a bunch of stuff early on while you're still training that makes your training way harder. So I've talked about the analogy of, you know, people say you can't out-train a bad diet. Um, it do, You know, if you have a healthy diet, um, speaking, from, speaking from experience, by the way, I just lost about 10 kilos. Um, uh I've got a, I've got one of the, I've got an assault bike here, you know. So if you use that as an example, so let's say a treadmill or, or um, you do, if you do an hour on the treadmill every morning, but you're still eating like absolute crap, bunch of processed food and sugar, and you're eating a massive excess of calories, um, you're not going to lose weight. But if you eat healthy and do an hour on the treadmill every day, you will lose weight. Um, it's the same with a dog if if you do all of your training and you do all of your management correctly you'll get really good results out of your training if you do the same training 
but then you take the do- a, a five month old pup down to the beach and let it off a long line and it goes caning around and chases a bird and jumps all over people and runs around with other dogs all off the long line and you're trying to call it back, it's not listening to its recall and it's all just chaos and you do that you know, from the time the pup's four months old through to eight months old and then you're trying to do um, 30 minutes of training a day and you're wondering why your stop drill isn't great, well that's why you know, um, and the horse thing falls into that category. Um, if you're trying to teach a, an up-and-coming deer dog to be nice and calm and slow and quiet and stay close to you and be really observant and, um, and, and you know, teaching at range and all of that sort of stuff and, and you're working on that and then um, you spend all weekend with it just charging around and while you're running around on a horse, it's going to make your training really difficult. You're not going to get good results. So it's that. It's definitely okay later on when the dog is fully trained within reason. Definitely dodgy doing it too early while you're still training. Um, I've got the note here, talk about my dogs and the e-bike. Um, but so by all means, you know, and I've talked about this a lot, um, it's basically the principle of freedom and responsibility and you know some people when they first look at the blueprint system um, when you first start watching and the pup's kenneled right from the start and it's basically either in the kennel or on the long line and a lot of training and everything's very structured but some people are a bit shocked you know they're like holy this is really freaking structured and strict and some people are almost like this is mean doing this with a pup but so often, uh, people trying to come into dog training and dog ownership with that attitude of wanting to be kind and um, quote unquote kind in brackets, um, wanting to give a pup a huge amount of freedom and running around on the beach and running around the park and running around with other dogs and off-leash in the off-leash dog park right from a pup and um, all of that chaos, by the time that dog reaches 12 or 15 months old, they've got a dog that has all these crazy bad habits and they actually can't let it off the leash at the park anymore. You know, or they can't let it off the leash at the beach. Or they can't even hunt with it off leash. Or they can't even take it hunting at all. Um, whereas at that point, my dogs are, are reaching the point where they can be off the leash for the rest of their life. You know, so it's that whole thing of doing it all properly. And the reason why I do it the way I do it, the reason the blueprint and the Palmico dog guide for that matter is the way it is. And and even the Palmico dog guide, which is our general dog training series, so not training a hunting dog. It's just showing people how to use my training system to just have a well-trained pup or dog as a pet. Um, it's the same. It's all the same. It's all crating and kenneling right from the start. You're basically either crating, kenneled, supervised, or on a long line right through. To and same thing with Mika. She's good as gold now, and she was a different. She was a a Vizsla cross, and she was the forward confident pup. She, <laughs> Miko was pretty freaking full on, and um, even me. I had that issue with Mika when she got to 12, 14, 15 months old and she was still full on. I was like, man, I'm supposed to be the dog trainer here. Um, and I've done everything correctly, but she just needed more time. She's there. She's been there for eight. She's good as gold now. She has been for a long time. Um, but, and that's why I've always said it. it's so worth putting in that work and putting a pup or dog through that sacrifice that some people think is over the top or mean, it's actually the best thing. It's the best thing to do for the dog 
and you end up with a well-trained, well-balanced, super happy, confident dog that you can now take anywhere and do anything with and they're never an issue. They're safe to have around for, for you and the dog. They don't end up getting run over on the road or getting in a dog fight or something crazy like that. Um, and they're just a freaking nice dog to have, and that that sacrifice and work and and you and talking earlier earlier on talking about like hindsight and perspective and things. Um, there may be times earlier on when you think, man, this feels like I'm being hard on the dog, or man, this feels like it's taking forever. Um. But once you get to where I'm at with Miko and I'm well down the track with print and you look back and you just go, man, that is nothing. And it is so freaking worth it. Um, especially when you see a dog that it hasn't been done correctly with and and they and some of those dogs can get way down the track. Their freedom is limited massively. Their lifestyle suffers massively for it. They have, you know, and... They have serious problems that you can put a lot of work into and you just can't get past them. And and this is the same thing. I'm like a stuck record on this. I've had this rant several times in the podcast. Um, it's the dog that loses. You know, so those people that are like, oh, that all that's mean and I want my dog to have a nice life and they're trying to do it too early. You're shooting yourself in the foot. And sometimes you're doing the worst thing for the dog. And sometimes someone trying to do that, trying to be nice to the dog and thinking proper training is cruel, their dog ends up getting put down. When when the person that they thought that was cruel for doing eight or ten months of proper training, now their dog's set and cruising and all off-leash at the beach. And anyone will look after your dogs. Anyone will look after my dogs. My dogs aren't a hassle or a drama or a pain in the ass. I can, you know, I can say, oh, do you want the people at the kennels, at the boarding kennels in Papamoa, um, they said, you know, your dogs are good as gold. Your dogs are awesome. Um, and I can leave them with people when I go away, and they're like, no, nah, it's not, the dogs are no drama at all. Um, whereas some people get into really difficult spots with their dogs through not the right amount of structure and training. And again, just to really hit it, um, if April with her dog and she's got her, and, and that's a cool thing, man, where she's got horses she wants a she if she's following the blueprint, she obviously wants a, a good deer dog. You can have I could do that with my dogs easily, do the whole horse thing. Um you can have uh, and, and I I re really enjoy that with my dogs. I've got these dogs that are great deer dogs. I can take them hunting. They're good as gold with that. But then they can just chill out around the house. I can um, take them out on the e-bike. If April does a good job with her dog and she's um, patient, she can have a hunting dog and then she can go horse riding on the weekend and the dog can run around with her on the horses. That's a really cool thing, man. It, it, takes, um, it does take commitment and patience and work, but it's... And, but, it's so freaking worth it. And you've got it for like, you know, a dog's a 10-year deal minimum. 10 to, an old dog's like 15, you know. Um, and talking about some of these dogs like um, GSPs and Vizslas and um, wire hair pointers and things, some of those breeds that take longer to mature are also well known for having long careers. You know, you do hear a 15-year-old Vizslas and GSPs and wire hair pointers, so you're probably going to get more off the end. That's that's more rare with um, Labradors especially. You know, a 15-year-old Labrador is pretty rare. Um, and I don't know of many 15-year-old heading dogs. I haven't really heard of many that old. You know, a 10-year-old heading dog's old. A 12-year-old heading dog's bloody old. Um 
you, I mean, you will get some, but if you look at a dog being a 10 to 15 year deal, um, and, and you also acknowledge the fact that you can completely screw it up and just end up with something that's just a total liability and freaking nightmare. Um, putting that work in to have a good one, it's just a no-brainer. You know, it really is. Right, I'm just back from a break. I just had to go and check my venison shanks that are in the oven. I'm looking forward to those. They're one of my favourite feeds off a deer. That's off one of the Seeker uh, that I shot with print uh, in, in those recent hunts there that I posted up on Instagram. Um, and that's my job this week, actually, is editing up that hunt um, where we shot three deer and all indicated by print. Um, one was tracked and the next one was a direct wind and then the third one was tracked as well. It's a pretty pretty cool hunt. It'll be quite a cool video. Um, yeah, the first one was probably a good sort of six or eight hundred meter track, probably tracking for about half an hour or so. Um, and then this, and that one, I just saw it, and she, we sort of saw each other at the same time, but she couldn't quite see me properly, and she just stood there while I shot her. Um, the second one. Was a, was a direct wind. I was heading up a gut and the print just gave a hard indication straight up. There was a cold breeze coming over the, coming down the face. It's only about 150 metres away. He just took me straight up this face. And, and then right as we got to the top, the wind was sort of coming up this gut and then down the face. So we sort of went up the face and did a little right hand turn. And that was a spook and shoot. This, we, the print was all locked up, and I was like, man, this deer's right here. It's creeping forward, looking, looking. It must have been like right in behind some fern. It was a young spiker. He jumped out, uh, but then I pulled him up with a fawn call, just gave him the old, Eah! and he pulled up, and I shot him. Um, and then the final one was uh, a short tracking job, and that was sort of a, well, that was a spook and shoot. Um, print started tracking um, kind of into a headwind and relatively short track I was sort of heading straight ahead I would have gone past about oh, 100, 200 metres sort of um, east of where these deer were and I was heading straight ahead and then Print just put his nose down and started tracking real hard and I thought oh, I'll follow this up for a little bit he looked real keen. I thought, man, these are pretty close. Um, and I followed him for probably about 150 metres, like five minutes, and um, just qu just slowly, quietly following him. And I had a feeling they'd be right there somewhere. And next thing, um, it was a big squeal out to my right, and and um, Print was sort of tracking. I'm trying to remember what the wind was doing. I actually think it was... He, we were sort of tracking into a bit of a side wind, but or about a forty-five degree angle wind, and but the wind was like forty-five coming at us um, on our sort of forty-five degree angle to our left, coming towards us from in front and to our left, and the deer were in front and to our right, so the print had no way of winding them, um, and they were just standing in some pepper woods, and we just come right out like right up. Um, close to them and they saw us before we saw them uh, it was a hind and a yearling and the hind squealed and ran about 20 metres and same thing I gave a fawn call like a Eah! and um, she stopped too and she was just squealing her head off over and over and over squealing um, and I use that fawn call a lot eh? if you can practice that I'll try to do a proper one <clears throat> It's usually, and usually when I spook a deer in the bush, it comes out all croaky because you've been bush stalking, so you haven't been talking, so your voice is funny, and you try to do it like straight off the bat, and it comes out a bit messed up. But if you do it right, it's like, like that. <coughs> That's not that good a one. Like that. Um, and it can really pull them up. Um, That's more of a, uh, not so much of a fawn call, but, it's more a slightly older deer, like a yearling, 
or eight, nine, ten month old yearling that gets split up from its mum. So they're a bit older and louder. Um, right up to pro- I don't know how old they do that too, but when you when the the guy that first told me about that had worked on deer farms, and he told me a whole story about when they split the yearlings up from the hinds, the weaners up whenever that is. So same as taking when you take the calves away from the cows, they'll do that. And um, I've actually seen that. I've seen a whole paddock of look like young deer yearlings, and they're all just doing that. A lot. Um, And I think it works good because you'll have fawns. You know, fawns do like a really quiet, tiny little nee, nee. Um, but a yearling, a, a, an older young deer, cranks out quite a bloody loud, that loud noise. And I think it makes sense because if a deer just hears a bit of a noise or sees a bit of movement out of the corner of its eye and gets a fright and just goes busting away, and straight away you go, eh. it's just thinking, oh, what the hell, I'm running, it's another deer. It makes them second guess. And it makes them way more likely to hang around and see what you are. Uh, I'd use it all the time. I go through runs. Sometimes I probably shoot half of my bloody deer using that. Um, and I'll do it automatically. I'll be hunting, and as soon as a seeker squeals, or if I'm hunting any deer, reds, anything, as soon as a deer starts crashing off, I'm doing that. Like it's it comes out. Um, involuntarily now as soon as the deer starts crashing off I'm just Um, and if they keep going I do it again and again and another time that I do it is if I spook a deer and it runs along you know it runs out of sight so I have to move in I have to move towards it I'll do it again and, and I know the deer can hear or see me coming but I need to move in to try and get eyes on it. I'll do it two or three more times moving in because that I've actually seen yearlings on farms, even in the same pad. It's a paddock of hinds and yearlings, and exactly like a lamb does. You see a lamb, it must have bloody fallen asleep or something, and the and the ewes walked away, and the ewes on the other side of the paddock having a graze, and the lamb just wakes up and like, where's mum? And it'll start meh, meh, running across the paddock. And um, it's doing it over and over, meh, meh, looking for its mum. And um, you'll see it, one a ewe come out of like hundreds of ewes and it'll walk over to the lamb and the lamb will catch up to mum and start having a feed straight away and all that. Uh, deer do exactly the same thing. And I've seen yearlings, it must be the exact same situation. The yearling's been having a feed or having a sleep or doing something. And it finally wakes up and is like, where's mum? And it'll, eh, eh. And um, I've heard, I haven't heard this on a deer farm because it's very quiet, but I have heard it in the bush when I've shot a yearling and the hind obviously doesn't know what's happening and it's calling the yearling like, hey, let's get out of here, but I've just shot the yearling. And the hind will do like a quiet, mmm, like that. It's like a, a it's, it sounds exactly like a quiet calf, you know, a, a cow, but a calf like, eh, just like a quiet moo. Um, so I'm acting like that. And um, as soon as I spook a deer, and this is what I did with the seeker, as soon as I spook it, spooked them, and they squealed and went crashing off, I'm, <coughs> and they, they stopped probably about 50, 60 metres away, out of out of sight. Um, and I needed to move, and she was just parked up in this um, pepper wood, as they often do, squealing her head off. This this old hind was just, wee, wee, over and over, as they do sometimes. And sometimes they will. They'll run into some cover, park up, and just squeal over and over. And... Um, I did it, they definitely heard me coming in, and I just gave her probably two more on the way in, you know, 
Um, I did another one before I started moving, just like, just quietly start moving in. And then while I'm still moving, uh, do another one. Right, and then right as I'm getting, and then I got to the point where I'm looking at the pepper wood that the squeals are coming out of, and then I just stopped, um, looked through the scope, and then just got a real clear shot of the yearling and shot that, and the hind ran away. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. It was two days hunting for three deer, um, and I've got it all pretty much on video, so I'll do a I'll do a proper edit and breakdown of that. It's it's well um, overdue to do a proper um, a hunting video. Um, next question, Elliot. Hi Paul, I think we accidentally jumped in the deep end with the choice of first ever dog, Jude. Jude is coming up two years old, heading dog lab cross, and we've been doing the blueprint from when he was a pup. He's young, male, and 100% full on. There was a calm pup in the litter, but we chose Jude instead, and while we never get rid of him now, we regret not choosing the calm one or just getting a lab instead. Our... Oh, yeah. Our vet said, I can tell he's a woeful dog. These collie lab crosses don't don't usually have very good temperaments. Um, it's interesting, and I, I spoke about that in a very recent Q&A, how some people say, oh, we'll, we'll cross a heading dog with a vizsla because heading, heading dogs are cruisy. Vizslas are a bit full on, so if we cross a heading dog with a vizsla, we'll get like a cruisy vizsla. Um, and it often doesn't work like that. You, end, you you often when you cross one, this is an oversimplification, but one way of thinking about it, and I've heard it said like this hard and fast by people that have bred a lot of dogs. Often when you cross, you just uh, intensify all of the bad points from both sides. So heading dogs can be very intense. And, and if you cross them with, with a Vizsla, which can be more slow and maturing and take more work, um, arguably not as biddable, arguably not as um, eager to please, you just cross that the intent, like because heading dogs can have that full-on working dog drive. Like they, It's a different thing. I've spoken about this a lot too. Heading dogs can just have this crazy drive. They can be calm and quiet and easy and biddable, but when you work with them a lot, you you often end up in a position where you're going, holy shit, this dog is driven. They just don't stop. You know, like doing those these recent seeker hunts. One day was 14 hour, 14 hour hunt. This is after not doing much hunting with print. At the end of a 14 hour day, um, I started at like bloody 5.30 in the morning, I say 6, um, and it was 8 o'clock, and I was sitting down with the venison from two deer in my pack, buggered, because um, it was basically f- the 14th hour, and it was almost dark, I just had the last 15 minutes to go down the hill to the camp, and I was just having that last little rest, because um, I was quite buggered. Miko was just flat out on her side, totally starfished, unconscious sleeping like straight within a minute of me sitting down and I've actually got video of this somewhere and um, Print is sitting there, he's sitting down but he's 100% awake and alert and he's just staring at this face opposite where, where I sat down there was quite a nice face opposite us and there's a lot of deer in this area, so there was sort of fresh scent. Print was sort of winding, you know, there was a bit of fresh sign up there or there was a deer way up there somewhere. And there was a bit of a breeze, um, just moving the fern around on this face a bit. And pr- so Print could smell there was a deer around there somewhere and the fern was moving around. And I sat there for about 15 minutes. I, I, I got back to phone reception right at that point too. And just... just this perfectly explains the drive that I see from heading dogs. Um, and sometimes from dogs that are more full on and you think, oh, this dog's got a lot of drive, but it's actually a little bit of craziness. They're the first one to fall asleep. 
you know, whereas the heading dog, for, you know, Miko can be pretty full on. She's way better now. She was a lot more full on when she was younger. But then give her two minutes and next thing she's asleep. But then when we're going again, she's she's noisier and more of a pain in the ass than Print is sometimes. Whereas Print's just cruising when he's hunting. But then when we stop, he's still hunting. So it's very consistent. Very, very consistent and incredible focus and drive and work ethic, you know. Um, that whole 15 minutes that I'm sitting there, I'm buggered. I'm collecting myself for the last little 15 minutes down the hill. Miko's asleep and Prince just sitting there, like intense as, you, as a dog gets, just staring, constantly scanning this face looking for a deer the whole 15 minutes at the end of a 14-hour day when we shot two deer. Um, that's what I mean about drive and all of that stuff. Um, and Elliot's saying he's got a heading dog lab cross that's really full on and the vet said that sometimes these breeds can be pretty full on too. And the vet said, I can tell it's a willful dog. Um... Elliot saying, I joined the Inner Circle member for a... Oh, I joined another Inner Circle member for a training session with his GSP lab cross that was around the same age and it was like a different world. Our dog is hard-edged, willful and beyond keen. I took him on a couple of hunts last year, shot a goat over him, but he was difficult to manage, so decided to keep training and wait until we have things a bit more stitched up. So it's good. So he's basically saying, I'm going to be patient, give the time, the dog time to mature and come on, which is, I've already talked about that a lot in this Q&A. Um, Elliot goes on to say, I've jumped enough hurdles with him now to know it's all possible. My partner has agreed to get out of the picture as much as possible for a bit as she struggles to maintain authority over him and things get out of shape quite quickly. Um, so that's a good example of, you know, Elliot taking these steps to make sure that there's not some other stuff happening where that's basically undoing his good work or making um, his progress more difficult. Basically that whole not out-training a bad diet analogy. It's, so it's all good stuff. We've gone back to more structure, kennel time, minimal time in the house, and he's responding well. All of that stuff's important too, man. And that's one difference between print and the blueprint and kenneling right from a pup, kenneling outside, not coming inside till later on, very, very structured. Whereas Miko's upbringing was more time inside, more time in, the, you know, uh, more freedom in the house earlier, a little bit more lax. And man, it comes through. It comes through in the dog's personality and training and everything. That structure in the blueprint really does mould a dog into a more calm, balanced, focused dog. It really does. The more you let up on that, the more it comes out in the dog. <clears throat> um, so Elliot goes on to say, just wondering if you'd be willing to say a few words on how dogs mature, especially young males, and anything on training or working with a dog like this. Cheers, mate, and thanks for making such an awesome course. Pretty cool for you to put it all out there in the public domain like that. I think we'll get there eventually, but just had no idea the size of the challenge we were taking on at the start. Um... Yeah, so I guess I've already talked about this that a lot in this Q&A, and I think this is the question that I keep referring to when I was saying, well, I'm going to get to this later on in this podcast. Um, I have. I've had that whole thing, of, and that's why I wanted to cover that off in this podcast, um, and it kept coming up and coming up, so I thought I just I hooked into it earlier there. But basically just that whole thing, man, and, and what you've done, everything that you've said here, You've jumped, jumped enough hurdles with them. My partner has agreed to get out of the picture for as much as possible for a bit because she struggles to maintain authority. That's that whole um, 
out training a bad diet analogy, making sure you're not doing other stuff outside of your training that's um, making your training more difficult, slowing down progress. And you also said we've gone back to more structure, kennel time, minimal time in the house, and he's responding. Um, you also said something about uh, that you know it's all possible, it's just going to take more time. And I've had that whole talk. I've pretty much already answered this question um, already, you know, talking about my whole situation with Miko, six or eight months, um, you know, she, like where Print was at when he was 12 or 15 months old, Miko wasn't there until she was like 24 months old, you know. Um, and even now, sometimes, you know, like when we're hunting um, and she's in at heel and Print's all quiet out front and cruisy. As if I put Print at heel, he's real quiet and cruisy. Um, and Print's not a real sneaky, dainty dog either. He's just sort of walking normally, and but, but he's just not animated. You know, and sometimes um, I hear a crack and a bit of noise behind me. I turn around, and Miko's just stoked to be alive. She's just that real happy sort of bubbly dog. But she's bloody, um, she's almost running on the spot, you know. She's panting real loud. She's like, <laughs> with her feet all rustling around in the leaves and moving around. And I'm like, settle down. I have to give her, She she's not doing anything wrong. It's just her personality. She's just really full on. It, imagine taking, uh, you know, a really happy, bubbly, chatty, talkative person hunting and you're just trying to hunt quietly and slowly all day and they keep, like, coming up with, hey, do, what about this or remember this or that? And you have to keep, shh, we're just, we've just we got to be quiet, <laughs> you know? And it's just that they're just not necessarily that cut out for it. That's sort of what it's like. Um, and you know, and that's the whole spiel and part one of the deer dog training blueprint. That's what I talk about at length, talking about choosing a dog and how I chose Pritt and the quiet dog and why you want to do that and all. It's all there in part one. That's where the whole freaking thing starts, you know. Um, and but you you will get there with dogs. Like I'm I'm going to um, and it's hard, you know, because. Um, I do so much stuff and Prince getting older and older. I haven't done anywhere near as much hunting with him over the last two or three years as I would have liked. Um, and all Miko really needs now to really click and calm down is I need to do some hunts with just her and put her out in front so she can sneak in on the deer and see how that all works. And then I think she'll click and be calmer and quieter and more sneaky in behind. She's in behind just as a spectator, just going, man, this is cool. Like, let's go get another one. But she's a little bit too pumped on it. She has, she needs to go out front and needs to learn how to sneak more and all of that. Um, she's just all too pumped and excited about it. So what I'm saying is even with these full-on dogs, you will get there. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Um, and, and I guess, too, like knowing it, too. And, and let's let's read. Uh, and we've got an update here from Elliot. So he said he just watched Q&A number 31 where you answered the question about the difficult GSP cross and talked about training a dog that gives you a lot of shit. All the stuff you said about wriggling on the stop, other forms of mucking around and nonsense give the dog an inch and it takes a mile, et cetera, et cetera. That's our dog 100%. Absolutely bang on. Basically came to the same conclusions myself. Regards being super on the ball, firm, consistent, nailing everything, lots of reps, good peripheral management, etc. So, you know, and, and again, this is like, uh, I think it was at Devon's reply earlier, like, um, Elliot's writing it here as good as I can write it myself. Um, just from being in the inner circle and listening to Q&As and all of that. He goes, Elliot goes on to say, I can't tell you how good it is to hear 
I'm not just imagining it and some dogs are just like that. You basically said all I needed to hear in that Q&A. I know what's in front of me now. If I'm up to it, knuckle down, push through, do the work. Just got to stay tough. Oh, sorry. Just got to say, though, that to go from never having owned a dog to that level of on the ball in less than two years has been a bit of a ridiculous steep learning curve. Just about sent me around the bend. Cheers, Paul. And I'd still be keen to hear anything else you have to say on this topic. So my notes on this talk about dogs maturing. I've already talked about that a lot in this Q&A. Um, my note here is Miko had a rough point where I was worried, but it was just a time and age thing, and she's really smoothed out. And it, and it really is a big contrast too, man. And there wasn't much more than I can do other than keep, managing the peripheral stuff just keep it wasn't a matter of doing a ton more turns doing a heap more stop drills and heap putting heaps more pressure on her it was just a matter of if almost lightening up a little bit but continuing to do the basics right keeping her on the long line keeping her within range doing the odd stop drill doing all the peripheral stuff right, not doing a bunch of stuff that screwed it out, and then just patience and time. It was just a time and age thing, and she's really smoothed out, man. And the and the difference and the contrast was huge too. It was huge. It's like in anyone, and you will know yourself, you know, and it's like some of these earlier questions in this podcast, guys are on part three working with a five-month-old pup, and they're going, man, it's... He's a pain in the ass on the stop drill. He just won't get it. But the difference between five months old and eight months old, those three months right there is huge. You know, the dog's capacity to learn and the amount of learning that it can do in that time and how much easier it is and all of that is huge. It's exactly the same. If you've, if you've got a dog towards the end of the blueprint but you're still going, man, this thing's still a bit of a handful if you look right for, if you've got a dog that's like 15 months old and you go, man, I'm, so I'm just going to lift my foot a little bit on this. I'm not going to do anything that's going to screw it up. I'm going to do all the basics right, but just give this dog time. And you look forward like eight or 10 months to the dog's like two years old. So you go from 15 months to 24 months old. The difference is massive. It can be huge and it can be so big. It can be so, you, you can't, you know, you, it's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, right? You can't just make that dog be someone else <laughs> when it, you know, when it's not ready to be. So you can't really do much about it. Um, if it's not, if you've done everything right and it's still not there, you can't do much about it. Um, but if you do all the basics right and you manage everything right, Turn around in, in, in eight months' time, everything could and probably and will be totally different. Totally different, man. And that's that's probably a pretty good bracket too. Kind of that from about 14, 15 months old, and you go, man, this thing still isn't ready. Or a year old, you know, it still isn't ready. When it's two, it'll be to everything will be totally different. Um and you be going, okay, sweet. I'm getting, I'm getting there now. Well, you're, you're saying your dog's two, coming up two years old, because what I was about to say is, you at two, you'll be going, okay, I'm really getting somewhere now. At three, you'll be looking back, going. At, at three, you'll be in a completely different place, and you'll be looking back to where your dog was when it was twelve months old, going, it was miles off there. Now that it's three, it's, I'm really getting somewhere. And then a couple of years after that, when it's five or six, if you've been doing everything right the whole time, you'll be where I'm at with print. Um, now that he's like six, and they just start doing cool. You start going, holy shit, that was cool. You know, and they're locking up and sneaking in, and like they're doing stuff that you didn't think they would ever do. Um, print had a couple of them on these these last hunts. Um, print, you know, yeah, print hasn't 
always had a heap of style and stalk and point and stuff, but he's doing that. He's 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 actually starting to do exactly what I was describing earlier that Tessa started to do. She was a Labrador. She never really had much stalk and style, and she great hunter, great indicator. She was never a a shambles or a pain in the ass. She was a really good, useful dog right from the start, like Print has been. Messed up, but basically never messed up any deer. Only helped to add to the hunt. Um, but she never had like fly. My little heading strong eyed heading dog fly. She always had a lot of style and sneak and um all of that right from a pup print never really had that um but he's starting to get more of it now you know it's pretty cool um another note here is that my continued experience has really shown me that some dogs really do need a lot more time than others and, and I've already been talking about that a lot. There's not really much else that I can elaborate than that. But over time, you know, working with Miko, having so many people use the blueprint, talking to so many people, um, watching the inner circle, working with other dogs myself, um, and just more and more experience and hindsight. And, and I've always knew this too. You know, I've known this for a long time. I knew it when I made the blueprint. Everything we talk about that in part one of the blueprint. You know, heading dogs are, are well known for being easy to train, are fast maturing, and um, Vizslas and GSPs are known for um, sometimes taking more training and be slow, being slower maturing. And there's some of these things that you know, and it's been a inter really interesting journey doing all of this. The big game indicating dogs and the deer dog training blueprint. Um, you know all, all of you guys that are following and everyone in the inner circle and there's so many people that, that are such massive supporters of it and really cool and it's awesome it's, it's, I've, I've also copped my fair share of criticism over the years too and people saying oh that's bullshit or this and that's bullshit or why did you say this and why did you say that uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is all of that stuff that's in the deer dog training blueprint and and pretty much everything that I've said being questioned about some and, and I've often like thought about it man am, is was I wrong am was I being too, is the blueprint too strict or or um is it that vizslas need to be trained a different way or or um are they just the same or what the more time that goes by and the more experience, it's really just reaffirming and confirming all of that stuff over and over again. Some dogs really do need more time than others. Um, and if anything, you know, the more experience I get, the more I just realize, like, man, that, that was true. That is true. Um, hitting dogs and labs... Are, are good. Vizslas, GSP, German way here pointers, those sorts of dogs could take a lot more work and time, and they really can, man. They really can. Um, choosing a calm pup really does help. Some breeds and some individual dogs really do take a lot more time than others. Uh, my final note on this is take a step back, stay relaxed, take your time. You can push too hard and make it hell. Or you can trust the process, be more patient and make it fun and easy. And that's my best advice for people who have dogs. They're watching print and the blueprint and going, man, he's doing everything so well. Um, my dog isn't doing it like that. My biggest advice there is that is just patience. And some of those dogs are just going to take more time. And they do, you know. And I've, I've been through it myself with Miko and loads of other dogs, and I'd been through it all with dogs before I even made the blueprint, you know, and that's why I used a hitting dog, and that's why all of, the, all of the things that are in the blueprint are in there, you know, it all come from a lot of previous experience before that, and and to be 100% to be honest, that's what I was trying to say before, is all of my experience since that 
has only reaffirmed everything that's in the blueprint. It really has. Um, it's it's yeah, it's aging very well. That's what it is. Josh, uh, I have a four month old GSP going great with the training program. We're having trouble with him putting his front legs up on the couch when we sit down, and he is having some free time inside as it's been very hot the last few weeks in Australia. We'll give him commander disapproval and push him down, which he then puts his paws up again. I give him a commander disapproval again, and then he crouches down and barks at me repeatedly. So I've been getting off the couch and drawing his attention elsewhere, but he doesn't seem to be getting the point of not putting his paws on the couch. So... My note on this is, this. don't take this the wrong way, but it's pretty blunt. That whole thing about, uh, or bringing a four-month-old GSP inside isn't in the blueprint, because we don't start bringing the pup inside till later on, and I'll, I'll give you a solution on this shortly. Um giving him a command of disapproval and pushing him down and then he puts his paws up again. This one, and then he, and then I push him down again and then he crouches and barks at me repeatedly. So I have been getting off the couch and drawing his attention elsewhere, but he doesn't seem to be getting the point. That drawing his attention elsewhere, I don't know where that comes from. But... Um, and my note here is that that isn't in the blueprint or the Palmico dog guide, so I don't even know what you're talking about. But I might. Um, I had a guy uh, one time, I think this was early Palmico days, so general dog training, he was a non-hunter, and and I was doing like live Q&As, and I got him on um, on the phone, and, and I answered this Q&A, and he was talking about how I'm following the Palmico dog guide, but I'm also working with this other trainer that's helping me to do stuff, and my dog keeps jumping up on the couch, and this other trainer told me to teach my dog to get off the couch. You get a treat, and pull the dog's attention away from the couch with the treat so the dog comes off the couch to eat the treat. And I've been doing this over and over and it's not working and the dog keeps on getting on the couch. And I said, and, and I said to the guy, or well, I, like this is just, <laughs> there's, there's a style of dog training that's like you don't do anything negative. You never correct the dog. It's all positive. You ignore the negative behavior and reward the positive behavior. Um, I've, way early on, I did do some experimentation with this style of training, and I did a lot of experimentation with treat training for a long time with a lot of dogs, and I didn't like it, and that's why I went away from it, and that's why I don't recommend it. It's, it's, there's a lot of issues with it. And, and it's like e collars Once you understand how to do it properly, you understand that you don't need to do it. Uh, it's like a levels thing, you know. Um, once you get to the level where you, where you understand how to really do it properly, you realize you don't you don't need need treats or e collars and it's not even the way to go about it anyway. Not in the long run. Um <clears throat> But I said to that guy, so if every time the dog gets on the couch, you get a treat out, and it, and, and, like, what did this guy say? What was the wording? Draw the dog's attention elsewhere. I get off the couch and draw the dog's attention away from the couch. So if this, this, I'm not saying you're using treats, you haven't said you use treats, but this other guy was. And he said, the dog gets on the couch and I draw the dog away from the couch with a treat. And then I give the dog a treat once it's off the couch. And I said, so if 
Every time your dog gets on the couch, you pull a treat out and draw the dog off the couch and then give it a treat. And then later on, it jumps on the couch again and you draw the dog off the couch with a treat and give it a treat. What's one way that the dog can get a treat? <laughs> it gets on the freaking couch. It, and some of this stuff is, is so can be so fundamentally flawed. And that's an exact example. Of, if you understand dogs enough to be able to use a technique like that properly, uh, and just telling someone that, like that's why there's so many long explanations and demonstrations and there's a lot of that talking stuff in the blueprint, not just telling you what to do, but explaining why you do it and all of the reasons and, and, and the deeper meaning behind everything and the psychology of it. It's really important that you really understand why you're doing something, not just what to do. Because otherwise you end up with a guy that's basically just giving a, his dog a treat every time it gets on the couch, which is freaking ridiculous. And that's what this guy was doing. And that's what you can end up doing. If you, if you give people, try to give people too simple of advice from, with sort of flawed fundamentals, um, uh, you just people would just end up doing crazy stuff, you know. Like, like once you start breaking it down, um, this guy was basically treat training his dog to get on the couch, and then asking me why it wasn't working when I don't even do treat training. Um, so I'm not saying that's what you're doing here, but I'm just um talking about this stuff, you know. Um. So the freedom and responsibility, you know, I'm saying, so the net, my other notes here is the dog's too young for that sort of freedom and responsibility, you know. Um, the principle of freedom and responsibility is really important here. Um, you could crate the pup inside. That's what I would do here. I would crate the pup inside. Um, and this is exactly why we don't do inside training in the blueprint until later on when we have a proper stop command. That's why we do it later on because... Um, to bring a pup into a household environment where these people are walking around and you're sitting down, it's all new and exciting, and and the pups off a long line, and there's multiple people walking around and stuff. Um, it's really just setting a pup up to fail. Um, and and if you're trying to control that with with sort of flawed techniques and principles and stuff, it's just it's just a mess, man. It honestly is. Um, um, in the Palmico dog guide that's my general dog training series and you can get that with the combo with the blueprint and if you've already got the blueprint and you want to add Palmico you don't have to buy the whole Palmico again for the full price you can email us um, and, and we can add the Palmico on for a massively discounted price or if you're buying it straight up first the first time I've got that combo there the Palmico on its own is is the same price as the blueprint but if you get them together it's not double it's only like sort of 30 percent more um or not even that um but in the Palmico dog guide we use a system of crating inside right from a pup so you can have the pup inside right from day one but we basically use those same principles of the pups either um, in the crate or on a long line, really. So if you were in that situation where it's really bloody hot, um, I would just switch to crating inside, and then <clears throat> the crate just becomes an extension of the kennel. And in the Palmico dog guide, we go through a whole other system of crating the pup inside, actually house training inside too, teaching the pup to be calm and quiet while people are moving around right from a young age. Um and then we transition that to the kennel outside. Um, and you can do that. That's sort of part of the reason why we set up that combo and that with the blueprint and the Palmico, and we can add it on for people, is that's quite a good comp, uh, That's quite a good option for some people that are in town or for whatever reason they want to have the pup inside. You can have the pup inside, you know. I think the, the pup being raised outside, it really does bring a whole another level of discipline and focus in 
you know, and you end up with like what Prince like, where he's it's just a diff, he's just a different machine, man. Um, his level of focus and and that is just next level, you know. Um, uh, it, it's like the difference between you know, um, I'm thinking of um, like MMA, like fighters here, um, like extreme athletes, you know, and you look at um, Khabib, you know. Khabib, the the um, the best, well, arguably the greatest of all time. Um, where's Khabib from? I, I I would know it, but I don't want to say it and get it wrong. He's a Russian, yeah. So he's from Russia, and they have a very um. What's his religion? They have quite quite a strong religion too. Um, and so he's from Russia, religious background, and they have a very sort of formal, strict lifestyle. No partying, no mucking around, you know, like they're very strict and regimented and stoic. And, um, you know, people talk about that. And, and what he was like and his level of training and his camp and that guy made a documentary on him and that guy that made the documentary and went over to where Khabib lived and saw what his lifestyle was like and what his training was like and what everything was like and he come back and was I saw him in an interview talking about it and he was just like man no one's ever no one from America is ever going to compete with that like he said his the lifestyle and everything, and there's their level of focus and the lack of distraction was just so intense. He said it just blew him away. He was just like, oh my God, it's just a whole different thing. That's what the blue, that's sort of what the blueprint is, you know. Um, it, it just creates a whole different mentality and way of learning and everything. All that kenneling, um, less free time and all of that. And, you know, how Miko grew up, more time inside, more freedom, a um, little bit less structure to the training. Um, it's it's like, that. so that's the same thing, like if Khabib was Khabib, but then he just sort of started partying and mucking around a little bit more. He's not going to be, he's, come fight day, he's not going to be as good, you know. Um, and that's what it is. It may be a little bit of a strange analogy. I don't know, but um, uh, and I can't even remember exactly where I left off on that from. But that's that's what it is. And and I'll, it's that's something that again going back to what I was talking about before, like um, because I do question myself. You know, I'm not the sort of person that's like oh, I'm right and this is the way and this is how we do it. You know, that's it's actually how I've le- how I learned. It's actually where everything comes from. Everything that's in the blueprint and dog training and everything all come from a place that I, and I've spoken about this in Q&As and other podcasts, where I, my dogs is growing up I, were terrible. And I knew I didn't know about dog training. I knew nothing about it, and I set out to learn everything I could about it. And I always keep an open mind, and I'm always questioning everything that I'm doing and everything that I've done and looking back and, trying to work it out and double checking everything you know everything every all your idea all my ideas stay on trial forever you know and some of the stuff um as i've tried different things and been open to new ideas and a, a little bit of second guessing too and from criticism and stuff like that like man what man you know People are saying this and that and the other, and I better look into this and work it out and make sure that that the stuff that I'm putting out there is correct. And if anything, over time, more and more, I just keep doubling back and going, man, this stuff's bang on. You know, and that's one thing that I've seen that I see in print and I see in other dogs, um, the good and the bad side of it from more, the more structured it is, the more they just come through with that crazy focus. Um, and they're just a completely different freaking thing mentally. And the less structure there is, um, 
the more sort of all over the place they are. I don't know how else to explain it than that. Um, and and that's really important, man. And and um, you know that that's what comes through when when um, you know pups spending too much time off the long line, out of the crate, running around the house, playing with kids, all of that stuff. Um, comes across to training and that'll ultimately come across to hunting. The more structured it is and the more it's just kennel, training, and that's it, the result is, the result follows through with that. Um, and and the more time that goes by, the more I'm just like, man, it, the more I realise how important it actually is. That's what I'm trying to say. Um... So back to Josh, um, if anything, if it's real hot and you need to have the dog inside, having a look at that Palmico stuff would be really good. If, if you're following the blueprint and you need to have a dog inside, we've also had, we've had people in, in um, really cold areas, you know, in Canada and stuff when it's like crazy minus degrees outside just totally freezing overnight and you literally can't keep a dog outside and they've had their pup inside and they've just crated inside basically followed all of the principles from the kenneling training from the blueprint and applied that to a crate inside the palmico dog guide has a heap more information on that too in and in a sort of another series of steps um, and while the Palmico dog got is a little bit more cruisy, there's definitely nothing in there that's that's going to totally that's going to ruin a deer dog, you know. Um, if anything, it's actually really good for people that don't that aren't willing to, or for whatever reason, don't want to do the super strict version of the blueprint. They can have a pretty good um, sort of a guide to some a little bit more relaxed ways of doing it without completely screwing it up. Um, Will, how would you recommend teaching a dog to not touch possums while feeding them possums? I've heard you can say it can be done, but not sure about it because he has been eating possums since a young pup. I've talked about this before and how it really doesn't matter a shit. Like, um, I'm th sure I've talked about this two or three times in podcasts. Um, so as far as I've heard you say it could be done, but not sure to go about it, how to go about it. So I would do it by doing the non-target species aversion training in the deer dog blueprint. It's literally in there, non-target species aversion training. It's in the later parts. I can't remember exactly where it is, seven, six or seven or eight. And we do it um, over, a, it's in multiple parts of the blueprint and we go through a whole system. Pretty freaking simple. Um, once... You know, particularly once you have a dog to a certain level of training and you have some commands and you have a bit of dialogue with the dog. Um, if a dog's completely untrained or you're trying to do it with a young pup that has no commands and do non-target species aversion training, you haven't got anything to work with because you don't have a dialogue with the dog. But once a dog is more well-trained, non-target species aversion training is fairly simple. It's all there in the... Excuse me, it's all there in the blueprint. Um... It really doesn't matter, man. Feeding a here's another note: feeding a dog beef bones doesn't want a dog doesn't make a dog want to hunt cows. I know what you're saying. Like you're feeding the dog possums, it's eating possum all the time. So when it smells a possum in the bush, it's gonna want to go for it. Um, and my next note is: I know what you're saying. It can have effect, but it's a small piece of the puzzle, and you can definitely work around it. Like, like man, I've I, I trapped possums for like nine years. I, 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 and I grew up shooting possums and feeding possums to dogs. Um, and I literally, Tessa, the dog I was talking about earlier, she like lived off, literally lived off possums. I used to go and stay in the bush for weeks and weeks on end and literally take no dog food. And she'd just live off possums the whole time. Um, and she was my trap line dog. So she'd lead me from trap to trap. And if a possum got out of a trap right as we got up to it, she'd grab it and bring it back. If a dead possum rolled down the hill, she'd retrieve it. I used her 
retreat, shooting possums, spotlighting possums and the pine cutover and that, she'd retrieve the shot possums out of the cutover all night. Um, and I'd hunt deer over her. And in the long run, it just never was an issue. Um, and she knew when we were deer stalking and not to indicate, well, she never indicated possums, you see. Um, like I never used her for indicating a possum 20, 50, 100 metres down the hill, taking me down there, and then I'm like, shoot the possum, and good girl. I never used her like that. Um, so as far as practically hunting, it never really was an issue. Undoubtedly, 100%, and I can vividly remember like it happening to a T, her taking me to possums early on in her career. Um, when I'd first had her in the bush, and particularly when I first, she'd, done a lot of work on trap lines for me, leading me around my trap lines, leading me from trap to trap. Um, and when she first started getting going, uh, when she first started going good on deer, indicating deer, and I had her out in front, hunting out in front, and she'd already indicated some deer and she was starting to get good at that. I remember, I remember the first time she did it markedly and it was, um, it was in Kaitawa, people that have read my book, recognize Kaitawa from my book and um, I left camp and I was climbing the spur straight opposite camp nice little spur with a couple of little guts to the side often deer kicking around in there and there'd been some kick, some pigs kicking around in there too right at this time and um, climbing up the spur and Tess had just done the classic wind and there was a nice wind coming up out of the gut and Tessa just stopped and was like winding and staring real keen, like, man, there's something here. And I'm thinking deer or pig. And so I'm sneaking real carefully. And the way, usually if a dog like this indicates a possum, the possum and the possum's in a hole in a tree, the possum, it'll look like a deer that's like, if once you know how to read a dog and you're reading the dog and you're like, man, this looks like a deer that's like over the brow of the hill, maybe 50 or 100 metres away, pretty close, but over there and and the dog's going in pretty keen and then but it's actually a possum like 20 meters away and uh so she started winding real keen and i'm thinking man i reckon there's a deer down in this gut like 100 meters i'm sneaking down sneaking down <clears throat> and um tessa walks up to this tree and 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 like stiffens up and like sort of cranes her head around the other side and she's, she's staring in this hole in this tree. It's a possum. As soon as the dog goes up to a hole, you know, little hole in the ground, that it's like blatantly obvious there's not a deer in this little hole under a tree. And it's obviously a rat or a possum. The second I realise, I just get out of it. And I turn around and walk away. And um, next time the dog, she indicates you follow it up like it's a deer every time. Always trust the dog until proven otherwise beyond all doubt. That's the key. We've got, we've got bumper stickers here. They're on the website. Always trust the dog. That's the golden rule. Comma, <laughs> until proven otherwise beyond all doubt. And then just go, get out of it and walk away. And they don't do it many times, man. And that's what the dog that was a full-time possum dog living off possums, walking trap lines all day, every day, retrieving shot possums, catching possums that that after she's been sent, mind you, when the possum breaks, she's still not allowed to chase it. I'm not saying she she definitely tried to break a couple of times and got a couple of growlings. Um, and she'd probably break if a possum jumped, got it, because every now and again, uh, the, the possum jumps real hard right as you're approaching it, you know, in the morning. And um, it does that last couple of real jumps and it'll get out like very, very rare, extremely rare. I'm talking like one in thousands. Um, if it jumped out of the trap right in front of her, her initial response would probably be to break and chase it. Um, but if I went, Tessa! She'd slam on the brakes and then I'd make her wait like probably not long because the possum's going to go up the first tree. Um, I could either let her just go um, or make her wait a moment and then send her. Um, 
and even then, once you get a certain way down a track with a dog, and and it's older, and you know everything's really solid, you can let them use their initiative and break and grab the possum before it climbs up the first tree. Um, as long as next time you can pull them up with a stop command, if you, when if you and you can get to that point where you can let a dog break and grab that possum before it goes up the tree. Um, same with a duck or if with a bird dog. There's no real scenario where you'd be doing anything like this with a deer dog. You never want to let a deer dog break. Um, but just a, an overall thing, once you're certain way, you know, I can let these dogs break the rules a little bit sometimes, go a little bit too far. Um, sometimes when I'm running print on the bike, um, and, you know, he's they're in at heel, they'll pretty much automatically wait as we approach one of the roads. Um, you know, we, we there's a setup where we go through all these different parks and um, every five or 600 metres we cross a road and then we go through another section of park and then there's another road and we go through another section of park. And with the dogs early on, as I'm approaching the road, I'm going, print, Miko, get in. You know, and if they didn't listen, I'd be like, get in! Like, pretty freaking hard on them, letting them know, like, we're not mucking around here with this situation. Um, and you do that a couple of times, and they're like, okay, when he says get in around these roads, he means get in. And then for a while, it was like, print, Miko, get in. Uh, and then eventually, and, and then, so you do that lots and lots of times. Uh, until you've got a real handle on it and it's working well. And 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 once you've done it, talking about never testing, and there's always contradictions right in all of this stuff, um, then one day, and it might be when you forget about it, you're approaching the road and you're like daydreaming and you're miles away and just when you think, oh, the road, and, and you're just about to think about giving the dog the get-in command, but they're already slowing down and swinging in automatically because you've done it every time. And that's pretty much what they'll do. They'll never leave it to chance, though. I'll always be watching, always be ready to give them that get-in command so they don't run across the road. But I'll say get in, cross the road, and then every time I cross the road, I'll give a double peep, the go command, which is to release print out so he can run his 10 or 15 metres in front and he's pissing on every second tree and going all over the place and having a freedom session running around um, through all the parks on the bike, you know, with the bike. Then eventually he'll just automatically come in beside me at heel and then once you cross the road, he'll automatically break the heel and go out in front because that's what I say every time anyway which is breaking a rule, right, because you should never let a dog leave a heel um, without telling him to first, but I do it. And you can let a dog use its initiatives at times once you're far enough down the track and you have enough of a foundation to know it's not going to cause too many issues later on. Um. Pretty big side tangent, but that's what these Q&As are all about. Um, but anyway, well, honestly, man, the possum thing's not a not a big deal. Feed your dogs as many possums as you want, if that's what you want to do. I really don't think there's any trouble with it. Do the non-target species aversion training. And, man, almost any dog at some point, I don't care how much aversion training you do, nothing. Even if it's like... Uh, I'll tell you later on and <laughs> later on in Tessa's career, the only time she would indicate a possum is if she's like literally stepping over top of it and it's and it's it's uh, you know un, in a tree stump and she's climbing over top of it. And granted, it was fair enough because her job for years was to not let me walk past a possum in a trap. But then she also knew the difference between a possum in a trap and not in a trap. And she knew she wasn't meant to indicate possums that weren't in a trap. Um, but it's a bit of a blurred line, right? Because she used to retrieve shot ones as well. 
and and we were all it's often we were looking for possums. She definitely she definitely wouldn't take me twenty meters down the side to them. Print does it every now and again. Print's done it occasionally, you know, because we only did that little bit of um, non-target species aversion training, and a couple of times I'm gonna say three or four times in Prince's career, when it's very, very close, I've never had him take me down the side or right around the face or something. Um, and it'll be when I'm going really slow and there's not much going on. And it's like a bit of a half assed indication. And I'm like looking at him and, and he's sort of winding and looking at me and a little bit of a wind. And you can see he's thinking about moving on, but no, no, he can sort of smell something. And I'm thinking, shit, is this like a an animal really far away? And I usually have to sort of encourage him to follow it up, whatever I can see he's picking up on. And as soon as I encourage him, he's like, oh, shit, do you want to Do you want to go have a look at this, you know? And he's sort of a bit funny, and he's sort of half ass winding it, and then he'll walk up to a tree or a stump or something, and, and, and it's a possum. And I just, I don't even bother, like, with the big harsh, get out of it, um, because I've sort of half... He's just sort of like, oh, I can smell something. You can see. And I see him thinking about it, and I tell him, let's go. Um, you can't expect a dog to just, like, not even react when it smells, you know, not even, like, turn a head. Um, and when he does that, I just quietly say, get out of it, and we carry on, you know. Um and Tessa used to do it, if she was literally like almost having to walk around one or climb right over top of one, which does happen sometimes, um, you know, one will be in a stump or in a hole or something and you damn near stand on them. Um, yeah, she'd do a, she'd do a like really weird, um, you know, stare at it and sort of look at me and just like, shit, there's one right there, but no, that was still meant to carry on. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I mean, I think I've covered it enough. It's just not going to be an issue, man. If you do everything right, it's really not. You might get taken twenty meters down the hill once or twice to get the point across, but that'll be the that'll be the worst of it. Um, Christian, hey Paul, hoping you might be able to discuss using unsuppressed guns over your dog, for example. Is there a need for more firearms training? Damage to ears, factory ammo choices. Um, I mostly use a 306. Have to have at least a 270 here in Australia to shoot Samba. Um, so they're not allowed to use suppressors in Australia, which I think is stupid. Um, it's just silly. It doesn't. It doesn't even make any sense. Um, any which way you try to slice it. Um, it's all just silly gun control laws, you know. Um, which again, yeah, it's just silly. And they've also got massive problems with low, too many deer in places over there, and and they've got these silly laws that you know suppressors here. You're not allowed to do control work for the Department of Conservation without a suppressor, because it's a, in New Zealand, because it's a. Um, health and safety hazard for the shooter because it damages your hearing and it's too hard on the dog. You're not allowed to do it without a suppressor. You have to use a suppressor when you're doing undulate control work for the Department of Conservation. And in Australia, they've got deer problems and they've made it illegal for people to use suppressors. Um, so it's I think it sucks. Um... But it's covered in the blueprint. We do talk about it in the blueprint. I do talk about that. Um, I talk about stopping the dog and 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 getting level with the dog or stepping just past the dog before you shoot. Um, we do talk about that in the blueprint. Um, yeah, and I would be more careful with my shooting training. Um, and I I would be more hesitant to do, you know, with your introduction to gunfire, I wouldn't want to do as much shooting over top of my dog. I know a guy that made his dog completely deaf in one contact 
shooting goats with the unsuppressed gun. Um, he might have even been only using a triple two as well, or it might have been a two four three, or a three oh eight. So it might have been a bigger one. It definitely wasn't a big thirty oh six or two seventy. But he said his dog had hearing, and one time, um, you know, it was like a hard block, and he'd finally found a mob of goats, and his dog was like right in front, and and he had to hook into these goats, and and you know, this dog had had heaps of goats shot over it. It was never going to be gun shy, um, and he shot like four or five goats with this unsuppressed center fire, like with the muzzle, um, right behind the dog's head. And um, he said that dog was stone deaf after that, <laughs> um, which is pretty gnarly, pretty rough. Um, but that's the reality of it. Um, when I was oh, probably about 15 or 16, I was muzzle blasted with a um, 7 millimeter 08 unsuppressed. And it was pretty much worst case scenario. It was probably the muzzle was about a foot behind and to the side of my left ear. And um, that that ear's never been Le- left ear is a bad one for shooters anyway, um, but that that and that was just like getting kicked in the head, and my ear was ringing for the rest of the day. And once you have one big damage event to your ear like that, um, you damage it so um, your ear then has less resilience to sound to to hearing damage, so everything after that actually damages it more faster. Um, People that haven't had a big event actually have more resilience to sound, but once you have one big event, then you're on the downhill slope. Um, Yeah, and my left ear is pretty buggered now. Um, Quite bad tinnitus in that, but... um, Yeah, so are you able to... discuss using unsuppressed guns over the dog I, we do talk about it in the blueprint when we get to introduction to gunfire and all of that I do talk about that um, and I talk about you know being conscious because we do it's some it's sort of a double-edged sword because you have to do your introduction to gunfire right and you have to do enough of it And you have to do it at least to whatever level you're going to expose the dog to when you're out in the field hunting. You can't just be careful and shoot away from the dog with the gun and then shoot right over its head on a deer because that could be worst case scenario. When you do that and you don't do your introduction of gunfire properly, I mean the one thing that can happen which is really bad is you just make your dog gun shy. But if you do it on a deer, you can make your dog basically deer shy. If the dog gets gun shy on deer, it can link taking you into deer to the gun and not want to take you in on deer. And I've heard of that happening, um, where the dogs had a, got shy of the gun around deer and the dog sort of takes them in and then it gets to that point where, no, shit, I'm getting close. And they start clamming up and thinking about the gun and not wanting to go right in. I've heard of that multiple times. So you do have to be careful. And you know that's why there's so much uh, introduction of gunfire work in the blueprint. It's quite the process. Um, we do it all properly step by step over several parts. Um, and we also combine it with stop to the shot and steadiness around the gun and all of that. It's quite the process. Um, But with an unsuppressed gun, and and we also, like I said, you've got to do, you've got to do in training, get your dog comfortable with whatever you're going to do with it in the field. So if you're going to shoot, potentially shoot over a dog with a suppressed 308, then you've got to get the dog comfortable with that in training. If if you're the, and I, I think pretty sure this is what we say in the blueprint that, you know, some people do shoot over their dog with an unsuppressed gun, and if you want to do that, do it. And if, as long as you train the dog right for it, try to be careful, because if you do do it in that really bad scenario where the dog is just forward and just off to the side of the muzzle, you can make a dog deaf in, in, in a few shots. You could have a serious impact on the dog's hearing in one shot. Um, and to actually talking about this, Prince hearing is nowhere near as good. I think actually Print 
has always had a bit of a hearing issue. One of his pups was deaf. Um, so I don't know if it's a bit of a hereditary thing or something. And in hindsight, I think even his hearing wasn't that good right from a pup. And his hearing is definitely not good at all now. And I don't know if it's hereditary from the shooting. I, I actually think it's probably a combination of the two. His hearing isn't that good now. It really isn't. Um, but you'll damage a dog's hearing even with a suppressed gun. Um, suppress 308 or something if you shoot too close I mean don't do it but imagine like like if it happens anyone that's had it accidentally been muzzle blasted with a suppressed 308 I'll be muzzle blasted in my right ear with a suppressed 223 and that wasn't fun that's not good for your hearing at all um it's still not good even a suppressed 223 man you keep banging that away in your ear to, you know, you get in front of that muzzle, it's not good. Um, and unsuppressed are just diabolical, you know. It's so unsuppressed. Man, when you haven't heard one go off for a while, which, I, you know, I only use suppressed rifles. Every now and again, I'll, 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 I'll go hunting with someone with an unsuppressed rifle, and it always surprises me. Like, holy shit, that's right. They are, like, ridiculously loud. Um, personally, I wouldn't shoot an unsuppressed center fire with the dog in front. Um, I would fall back to letting the dog indicate, take me in, get the deer pinpointed, put the dog on a stop, get in front of the dog and shoot. And um, there's actually a really good demonstration of this, of me shooting two deer using that technique um, with print in a video I think it's on Big Game Indicating Dogs YouTube channel it's called Hunting Seeker Deer it's called Hunting Seeker Over Indicating Dogs Hunting Seeker Over Indicating Dogs is the title of that video um, it's a video I made shooting seeker over print and um, I actually want to make. I actually want to make a, a video talking about that. Well, I actually spoke about it in that video. I did, and um, because I I actually used to hunt like that quite a bit. It was just one of my preferred ways of hunting, and I'm doing it more and more with print now. And that's one of those things with more and more experience, and then hindsight, and you're thinking, you know. And, and I was like, man, I actually used to do this more. And it's actually a freaking really good way of hunting over indicating dogs sometimes. It's definitely, at the very least, a really good and important tool to have in the belt, you know. And it's, um, you have the dog out in front and the dog's indicating and taking you in. And once you get to the point where you're like, the dog's really locking up and it's starting to look for the deer and you know, 100% man this deer's right here somewhere and um just around the we just got to move a little bit more and, and change the angle and see through a few more trees or come over this brow and there's going to be a deer right here um then anchor the dog you can you can do it with a silent stop sit command the hand signal sit the dog down you catch up with the dog and then put it in at heel and then you move in on the deer like that and and it it's it it might sound complicated. It's not complicated at all. It's actually very simple and easy. It works extremely well. And there's actually a lot of good arguments to be made. And in some situations, it's actually better than even having the dog out in front. There is that advantage if a dog is a very sneaky, pointy style of a dog. I used to do it with Fly a lot. She was so freaking. She had really good hearing. She really did. She was so sneaky and so good at sneaking up on animals and pinpointing them. I was actually better. I had more of a chance than spooking them than she did. And if I tried to anchor her like that and get her in at heel and go out in front, I would spook more animals doing that than if I let her ninja out and she didn't do the slow motion creep and like lock up. And then I would know right where the animal is and I would sneak in behind her and shoot it over her once she had it pinpointed, and I'd never get it wrong. Um, print isn't quite as sneaky, and I mean, shit, 
a lot of that was with goats too with fly so that's a little bit different um and that was just the style of hunting that I was really geeked out on at the time. Like, man, I just leave my dog out in front. She sneaks in and locks up on it, and that's the ultimate, and that's what I want to do. Um, it's not necessarily the ultimate, you know, and um, and every situation's different. And quite often now with print, I'll leave him out front for longer. Um and other times I'm like, okay, I know there's an animal here. I know where it is. And I actually want him in beside me here and I want to sneak forward myself. And it's just it's just a style that I'm using more now. And as I've been using it, I mean, and, and I used to shoot a lot of deer like that with Tessa. Um, and, and I tell you what, to fly if you put her in behind, she would sort of clam up and drop lip a little bit. She wasn't as active from beside or behind. Tessa was really good from beside. And she'd actually be beside me and basically doing everything that she would do in front, but from beside me. So you're doing the same thing anyway, except you don't have that lag of the dogs out front and the deer might see the dog and spook and you're still seven metres back or four metres back out of sight. Print is excellent at the side. He's doing everything at the side than he's doing out in front. So, and Print is amazing at pinpoint, at pinpointing a deer off the scent. He is uncanny at that. Fly was a lot more off the ears and eyes. Um she was unbelievable off the scent too but print is just every dog slightly different you know and um, I'm just really liking that style of having print out front uh, obviously the dog can't lead you tracking from the side but they can wind from the side and um, he's he's out front hunting if he starts getting on a wind and starts taking me in and then he starts getting it pinpointed and he's really locking in on a spot. He's like looking right there because that's where he knows the deer is. Um, he goes bloody well from in beside. Um, and that's a great way to hunt. With That's, that's a great tool to use with um, unsuppressed rifles. And, and it, it is, and I talk about it in there too, and it's showing really plain, really um, well in that video. It's on Big Game Indicating Dogs YouTube channel, Hunting Seeker over Indicating Dogs. So, um, yeah, basically the dog stays out in front, does everything right, does everything the same as, as everything, you know, that we do in the blueprint. Everything's from out in front, and once you're like, man, this deer's right here, the dog comes in behind, and in the blueprint, we do try. We do train that right in by tight in behind heel, which is good to at least have set up and have a dog that knows how to do that. But this is more letting the dog be like beside you. So I'm sneaking forward, looking for the deer, and I basically I don't even need to turn my head or anything. I can just glance down, and I'm looking at the dog, and he's doing everything next to me that he would be doing out front and it's in that video but I was thinking about it and and even um I'm trying to remember here I'm pretty sure that's how I shot that spiker that I was speaking about in this recent hunt uh, once we got on top of the spur and print started locking up and I was like man this thing's right here and I just gave and I can do with print I can either if he's right out in front I can just give us hand signal to sit and then we're not and, and again here's one of those contradictions you're not meant to let a dog get up off a sit without giving it its go command but um if i tell him to sit now and i get up level with him and keep going he'll just drop in right behind me or basically just take up take up on my side doing the basically indicating from heel and um if he's closer, because if he's five, six metres out in front, and I can give him a heel command too, I can just point behind me and he'll come back to heel. 
But if he's seven metres in front and I'm going to where he is anyway, I don't want him to make that extra noise and movement of coming back to me. I'll just tell him to sit. But if he's real close anyway, I can just point behind me and he'll come around and behind me. Um, and talking about that point and come around and behind me, Prince, like gold with these things now is hand signals and stuff. Um, if the dog is five metres out in front and you can see a deer in the distance and you're like, man, I don't want to shoot over my dog, you should be able to get them set up so you can point them behind you and they'll come back into heel. You know, and you can work on that in training and you can work on that in your shooting drills as well and get a dog that, shit, there's a deer here. Um, if it's a real emergency and, and because I've had hunters say, oh, stuff that, mate, I'll shoot my unsuppressed gun over my dog. If that's you, do it. <laughs> you know, I've told you everything that I think about it and that you could easily make your dog deaf and you probably will, but if you do or your introduction to gunfire training correctly, you can do it. Um, and that's all in the blueprint. If you d don't want to make your dog deaf, which I would recommend avoiding, um, you can do, you, you should be able to, you can. You can get your dog to come back in behind with a hand signal. That's what print does. Um, and, and even more, you can, as you know you're getting in close, you can get them in behind before you even get to that point and close that last 50 metres in the bush with the dog in beside anyway. And they're doing everything right there that they're, they're doing out in front. So, Because I have heard this argument, and I think I, I did, got a little bit hung up on it. Um, I actually had a guy um, saying, oh, you know, a real, de a real indicating dog's out in front and, you know, these dogs that just pet guys have them in beside you and they just have a bit of a sniff and that's not a real deer dog and a deer dog's got to be out in front. And I agree I agree to a degree um, and I definitely would never want to have a deer dog that is only hunts at heel and there is loads of stuff that they can do out in front like tracking and taking you in and they can hunt better out there and take lead you right in and track for bloody kilometres and... Um, take you in 600 metres on the wind, but once you're getting in close, a dog can do everything next to you that they can do 10 metres in front of you, and there's lots of situations where it's actually better. Um, and that's not in the blueprint. That's why I put, and that was a, lot, a good couple of years ago that I put it in that hunting seeker over indicating dogs video. Um... But I've just thought about it a couple of times recently, particularly on these recent hunts. Like I almost need to do an update in the blueprint, or I thought at least I want to hammer that out in a in a Q and A, you know. Um, and again, man, it really sucks that you guys can't use suppressors in Aussie. It doesn't even make sense. Um, and that's it. That's the last question. So um, thanks everyone who signed up to the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. Uh, thanks to everyone here for these questions. Um, late again, like usual on these Q and A's. It's just always have busy doing stuff, and um, it's not always easy to get a a time gap and get everything set up to lock in 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 the room here and um do do these things for three hours, you know. Um, but and I always say I'm going to do the next one sooner and I'm going to try to do that this time too I see there's already a couple of questions there I've got another hunting Q&A to do as well and um, I really want to get back into doing more podcasts with guests and making more hunting videos as well over the dogs um, thanks everybody uh, if you want to find out more about big game indicating dogs and the deer dog training blueprint you can go to biggameindicatingdogs.com you can follow us on Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And you can follow my stuff at Paul John Michaels at Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.